welcome everybody. Um, it's, it's always, as you can imagine, it's always kind of anxiety producing to, to actually produce these events. So, and we could not do it. We don't, we wouldn't want to do it without you coming to share this with us. So we want to welcome you uh, to this uh, racial justice collaborative program. Today, we're going to be delivering uh, findings. Uh, Giordana has done research looking for evidence of uh, other people have created this out there, but it's hidden. And so she's been compiling evidence of the, the families, the companies that, cr that uh, created their wealth from slavery. And so today she's going to bring her findings to us after these years of uh, doing this research. And more than just the wealth that was created from uh, slavery, she's going to show how um, the wealth from slavery has created our modern US economy. So we're, we're all hearing all the time, uh, people speak of um, questioning whether uh, slavery built the, the modern US economy. I don't think there's any question and that today is what we're gonna talk about. So just as a reminder, if you don't wanna be seen in any aspect of yourself, of course you can be because this is, you'll wanna be, this is a momentous occasion and, um, and you're gonna to wanna to look back and see that you were here. Where was I the first time that these findings were presented? And so you'll be here in the video. We're going to, uh, in a minute, I'm going to introduce members of the Racial Justice Collaborative in attendance. And let me tell you how this event will go today. We have a uh, Farrell Saunders, who is our Racial Justice Collaborative historian. And so he looks back uh, to see, to pull together the pieces so that as we present these programs, we can, we can see how they are the beginnings of them. And so he's put that all together in a video. So we're gonna look at a video of uh, Farrell's, his, the historical aspects of wealth from slavery. And then we're going to hear from Giordana, uh, Giordana Hart. Uh, Giordana, I'm gonna introduce her later, but Giordana is a, um, racial justice facilitator with the Racial Justice Collaborative. She is um, an attorney practicing in uh, the United States, in Massachusetts, in uh, Florida, and also in Canada. So she's a busy attorney. So thank you, Jordana, for all your work. Again, we're recording this. So don't forget that, uh, that we're recording. And we have today a special guest that of uh, Trevor Smith. Trevor will introduce himself later. Trevor's a researcher and a, a reparations researcher and a communications authority. So we're, we're, we're not just, this is great that we're pulling all of this information together, but we have an agenda. And uh, as we're going through this year, we're coming more and more clear about reparations, reparations for the American descendants of the enslaved. So that's what we're pulling things together for. And you'll hear more about that. Um, she and Trevor, Jordana, she, she and Trevor will engage in a question and answer session. So Jordana is gonna do a presentation and then a question and answer session with uh, Trevor. And as Jordana reads each question that they're going to be looking at, Catherine, um, who is our racial justice collaborative uh, facilitator and chat monitor. So Catherine is monitoring the chat. She's gonna drop into the chat the questions so that you can remember what the questions are. So that's pretty much what the agenda is today. At the end of this question and answer with Jordana and Trevor, we're going to open the discussion for participants to engage. So while everything is going on, you might just um, 
write your questions in the chat or any thoughts that you have as you're watching this, just write that in the chat. So also remember, in addition to recording everything, we're also going to be saving the chat so that we can look at this more closely. We're, we're a largely educational and facilitation volunteer organization. I say that volunteer because you're all here, you're interested in this topic. We hope you'll want to participate more fully with us. So I'm offering the opportunity for you to join us to volunteer in some aspect of, especially this reparations we're in a movement for reparations in this country. So, so we're, we're fully involved in doing that. We hope you will join us. You have uh, all kinds of opportunities. I'm going to drop the, and I've already dropped the Racial Justice Collaborative website in the, um, uh, in the chat. So if you go there, there's a place where you can send uh, you, you can communicate, you can contact us. You'll actually contact me directly and I'll respond. So before we go on any further, can I ask um, the members of the collaborative, you, you see up on the screen, we're, we're letting you know that we do have some sponsors that we're very grateful for. We have a platinum sponsor, that is the Sierra community, but we have other sponsors We've got the Somerville Arts Council, the Massachusetts Arts Council, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the uh, Whalen Cultural Council, the Wellesley um, Cultural Council, Natick Cultural Council, and finally the Newton Cultural Council. So we've got, there are many people that are interested in developing uh, a dialogue around reparations. So uh, I'm looking on the screen. I want to bring uh, the names of the collaborative members. Catherine Saunders, she's monitoring our chat. Uh, Catherine, can you wave? There's Catherine. And then uh, Farrell Saunders. Farrell is our historian. Uh, he's got this uh, presentation you'll see in a minute. Farrell, can you wave? And Larry uh, Lawrence Aronson, long time and now retired teacher, historian. We got a lot of historians. Lane, Lane Arie, he's here. He's a member of the collaborative and, uh, and, and you'll hear more about Lane soon. Frank Eason, Frank is, uh, he keeps us, he keeps us uh, with our, our feet on the ground and, uh, and, and bringing up things. He's also our technical advisor, as is Adam. Um, Adam, uh, you might not see Adam. Oh, there he is. But Adam is here. He's doing the, the technical aspects today. And Sundiata, our, um, our, he's our poet, our uh, writer, our, our songwriter. Uh, he's a, a rap artist. Uh, he's a children's book author. So, um, okay, and Jordana Hart. And there may be others that I missed. Let us move right into the program. Let's everybody take a deep breath in and exhale. And anytime you are feeling any stress, remember to just take a deep breath in. So uh, now we're going to uh, switch to our video. Um, and so whenever we're able, we'll start to see the video. My name is Farrah Saunders with the Racial Justice Collaborative, and this is Touch the Hand. This portion is called Touch the Hand because of how close in proximity we are to the history of slavery. Often viewed as something that is far off and distant or ancient history, we are so close to it that we can reach out and touch it. And my own personal example, my great grandmother who is still alive to this day, we have pictures of her picking cotton with her mother as a sharecropper. This close to the history of slavery, we can reach out and touch it.
something that's important to understand about the history of slavery is despite its close association in terms of how it's presented, in terms of how it's written about with the history and culture of the Southern states, the slave trade is of tremendous importance to the Northern states as well. The actual shipping and the transportation of enslaved people and a very important backbone of the slave trade itself was something that was dominated by Northern merchants and held an incredibly uh, close uh, importance to such uh, Northern cities like uh, Providence, Rhode Island. You even have prominent institutions that are recognized and honored to this day that have direct ties to this with the uh, Brown University, an Ivy League school in Rhode Island, very famous and prestigious, being named after a slaveholding family. Something that's important to understand about the history of the slave trade in the United States is its role has a greater system in the triangle trade where we had goods going from Europe to Africa, enslaved peoples going from Africa to the United States, and pro uh, products made by those enslaved peoples going from the United States back to Europe. As this uh, triangle trade, this interconnected system that was the historical backdrop for how all of this began and how all of this included and would evolve into greater manifestations of the slave trade in the United States down the line. In the history of African peoples being enslaved in the United States, despite this going all the way to the pre-state history, of just the 13 colonies, it exploded in value and exploded in wealth at a certain point. This point in the history of enslaved peoples in the United States would mark a vast change and ramping up of the people needed to work in terms of production of resources like cotton in order to maintain certain needs. This would mark how slavery became so much more important after this time and why the value of the individual slave would shoot up. The reason for this, historically speaking, was the cotton gin, which was a machine that was invented that rapidly increased the amount of cotton that could be produced. It was a hand crank machine that allowed for the rapid cleaning of cotton and the sorting of seeds from the cotton fibrous material itself, which you actually use to produce finished goods. There had long since been prior to the invention of the cotton gin an expressed need to need may even be an incorrect word, but it was a whisper that was that slavery and slave holding specifically in the southern states would eventually fizzle out and die because slavery was not economically efficient enough to justify the practice of such a thing. However, after the invention of the cotton gin, the amount of cotton produced only a few years after was tenfold what it had been prior. And as a result of this, slavery dying out because of economic, uh, 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 not being economically valid enough, that was nonsense. That was so far from the facts, so far from the truth. And so because of that, slavery only began to take off more. This gave rise to the phrase of King Cotton, in which the production of cotton in southern states, now amplified through the machine cotton gin, was so valuable and so economically powerful that it became king. It became the dominant force. Because of this, there was a greater necessity for enslaved peoples. And so 250,000 new enslaved people arrived in the United States between the years of 1787 and 1808. This was equal to the entire amount of slaves brought to the United States in the entirety of the colonial period before this point. 
all just in that short span of time because of how economically powerful slavery now was in the United States due to this machine, due to the rise of King Cotton. After 1808, individual or external slave ports and importation from Africa to the United States had become outlawed, but not the internal slave trade, which of course gave rise to continuations of so many practices such as uh, things that were basically slave breeding and maximizing how many enslaved peoples you could get out of the ones that you already owned or could trade for internally within the United States between individuals in the planter class. This rise, this massive boom in production in the South caused a similarly rapid and expansive boom of textiles in the North. In the former triangle trade system, the vast, vast, vast majority of production was made in Europe, and it was just raw resources that were transferred from the states or the 13 colonies back to Europe to be made into textiles and such in the factories. But now with this massive boom of increased production in the South gave rise to the production of factories in the North, which were now being made to mirror those in cities such as London. It was often immigrants to the United States that were fulfilling these roles and these jobs in the factories in Northern cities. And so that was a massive part of how that entire culture came to be. For the majority of this, we have been talking about what slavery and the cotton industry and all the economic values that this went, came into in both the planter class and the factories in the North, all that and what that meant to those individuals. But in terms of what this meant to the enslaved, in terms of what this meant to the individuals that were actually laboring in these fields in order to turn the wheels of this machine, it was more suffering. It was more atrocity. An entire amount equal to the century, over a century, of time spent building this up since the inception of these original colonies in the United States. Equating what was just made in this short span of time because of how much more economically profitable it was, it was exponential increase of suffering and bondage. It's important to remember just how closely tied the North and the South are in the slave industry and how the entirety of the slave trade fuels each other together. As people generally only think of where the majority of slaves were actually physically kept, where the majority of the slave labor was physically done, but all of this is an interconnected system. And thusly, all of this was just as heavily connected in terms of the economics of it in the North as it was in the South. Thank you for your time. I'm Farrah Saunders of the Racial Justice Collaborative. Thank you. Thank you, Farrell. Uh, as, as always, thank you for your, uh, for your work bringing us the, uh, history. And uh, so I want to now introduce uh, Jordana Hart. Jordana, as I said before, is a practicing lawyer uh, in, in North America. And um, she's a member of the Racial Justice Collaborative, a facilitator, a racial justice facilitator. So Jordana, please come. And remember everybody, we're recording. So if you don't want to be seen, just tur turn off your video. So um, welcome everybody and thank you, Diane and Farrell for always having these really grounding presentations on the history. As some of you know, Farrell creates these uh, presentations to give context to all of the different uh, presentations we've done and, and he's done it again here and thank you so much and also to the team. So as Diane said, I've, I'm a member of the team. I've known Diane and the team for a long time. Um, I've also 
been doing a lot of research over many years about reparations, particularly to African descendants of, of slavery or ADOS. And you can look up that acronym. There's a lot of information about that movement. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Trevor, who's here. And thank you, Trevor, for agreeing to be here. He will introduce himself. He has a really interesting background. He does research into reparations from various angles. Um, to me, this presentation is fundamental to everything. And in some ways, maybe we should have done it before looking at the GI Bill and redlining and everything else, because this is really the root of, of everything up to the moment. It's a stepping stone toward November when we're going to do a reparations demand. Um, and I hope all of you can come to that race retreat. Um, more information will be given about that. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Pharaoh for talking personally about his great grandmother. Um, it reminds us that this discussion is not just the cold hard facts of economics and finance, which of course are embedded in that system of the slavery, of the economics of slavery, but it's also about people. It's about the black people who, who were and, and are being damaged today by it. It's also about the uh, white, amassing and hoarding of wealth, which continues today as part of a, a system, whether whites are engaged in it, and I include myself when I speak about whites who are benefiting, uh, whether they're engaged or not, they are benefiting, and this whole system needs to be essentially restructured, but it cannot be restructured until we have a, a better understanding of really how where it grew from. Um, so I want to acknowledge that trauma to people and the effect of this deep cruelty over, you know, over centuries, really not stopping at emancipation, but up to this very day. And I especially want to point out that the, this trauma is becomes deeper when particularly whites question and are sarcastic and are and, and ironic, I guess, about the legacy, a legacy of, of slavery and calling it ancient history. So um, it, um, Adam, if you could put the first slide up and I'm just gonna help Adam along as I'm speaking, so. I think there's a little bit to come down here. There we go. So basically this, uh, this presentation is really for us to understand and contemplate the, leg the economic and financial legacy and business legacy uh, 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 of slavery and how it still impacts black families, but what I want to, and black business, but what I want us to keep in mind is also how it has benefited at the same time. We tend to erase whites. We keep looking at these things happened in a passive way to black families, black businesses, uh, and the descendants. And, and there's an e a very active side to this, which has to do with white families, white businesses, and we'll get into that more. Um, what I also want to say is that all, a lot of the, this research that I've done, there's nothing special about what I've done. It's just something to me that's fundamental to this situation in the U.S. and actually Europe, Canada as well. And um, there's a lot of research and data. Um, Raphael Bostic, who's the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, I read an interview of his and he was talking. He said basically, and I quote, a lot of research creates a lot of knowledge. But his goal and ours is to activate that knowledge. It's not to keep perpetuating journal articles and, and articles, but to move this into action. Um, next slide, please, Adam. Now, you, many of you might recognize this cover of The Atlantic. It's the extremely famous and influential article uh, by ta Coates, The Case for Reparations. I bring it up because it reminds us in a very succinct way of of the time frame we're talking about. We're not talking, we're talking about the 250 years of slavery, but the theft of skill and expertise, the theft of land, the theft of, 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 uh, of labor continued after that. Uh, in a way, uh, Pharaoh touched on it, um, Pharaoh touched on it. So I wanna keep that in mind that we're talking about a system that has continued to this very day and 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal and 35 years, well, probably more now, this article came out a few years ago and we need to reckon with this. And that's what we're trying to do here with the Racial Justice Collaborative. Um, next slide, please. 
we talk about generations and Farrow talked about generations. And I have always like, what is a generation? We kind of throw the term around and I've kind of researched it and generally economists and others who look at history and the through line to the present, they look at it as 25 to 30 years, which is interesting. It's the span typically, I mean, obviously that's just a, a, an average or a median, the span between the birth of a parent and her child or his child. And going back to what Farrow said, you think about this, you look at elders, African-American elders and white elders for that matter, born in 24, for example, and, and still alive today, the, the African-American elder could have, been, is, could have been the grandchild of someone born into slavery in 1864, uh, someone they knew and they loved growing up, you know, Pharaoh knows his great grandmother um, and, and, and whatever trauma she inherited, whatever knowledge came to her about her, her forebears has reached into, into his family. And again, I put the same of the, the descendants of enslavers. There are whites today who are linked fairly closely to enslavers, enslaver families. I use it enslavers, uh, you could say slaveholders. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. I bring up um, this issue of Zora Neale Hurston, a book of hers recently came out, even though it's based on her 1930s interview with a particular formerly enslaved man named Kajo Lewis. Um, you can look him up. He brings in his interview, and she uses his own words, he remembered his experiences, and more so he remembered the broken promise of the 40 acres and a mule, which we've discussed, which was a promise to attempt to repair uh, the formerly enslaved people that eventually uh, came to nothing. Um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to bring up this book also. It's called The Half Has Never Been Told. I'm not sure why we can't see the whole sleeve, but it's uh, the author, Edward Batiste. This book to me is extraordinary. He reminds us in his book while he's looking at the economics of slavery, he keeps going back to the people, the, re the revolts, the uprisings, the pushing back that went on all the time. And in this quote, I think it captures it. He said, instead of being individual misfortunes, enslaved people realized their own experience was part of a giant historical robbery, a forced transfer of value that they saw every day in the form of widening clearings, cotton bales moving toward markets, and the slave coffles heading further in. Now, the context, I'm sorry, African Americans were not confused about what they thought of slavery's expansion. Pharaoh touched on this, this huge boom in cotton with the gin and so forth, and that it expanded slavery and, uh, it within, internally within the United States. And this, is, this quote and this giant historical robbery is what this refers to. And when you read this book, he, he, he uh, uses the voices, the direct language of the formerly enslaved in their many memoirs and interviews through the 1900s uh, you know, um, to talk about what they remembered. Um, I also wanted to point out another example of closeness. So when I, in the 1990s, I was a journalist with the Boston Globe and I met a, a black journalist who was in his eighties then, his name was Mabry Doc Counts, K-O-U-N-T-Z-E in Medford, Massachusetts. I think he was 84 at the time. He wrote a memoir and he did a lot of research into his family, but essentially his grandfather, whose name was Hillard, counts had been born into slavery in Virginia. And so Mr. Counts, um, Doc May Mabry Doc Counts knew his grandfather and I was sitting at a table in his home in Medford. And again, we go to touch the hand, uh, this was back in the nineties uh, of being that close to someone who is himself so close to the period of slavery. Um, so uh, the next slide, please. Um, so I want to hear, these are just, I know it's a lot of writing, I'll try and, and just get through it, but essentially I want to talk about the centrality of slavery, um, you know, that the slavery and the subsequent, you know, almost 200 years of economic and social brutality, the effect it had on descendants and the descendants today. Um, but it also, we have to look at it again. What did it do? The wind in the back, the economic wind in the back of white people, white enslaved 
uh, white enslavers, um, their descendants, their businesses, and the growth of their businesses after emancipation. Um, we often hear from whites, and many of you have probably heard this, but including immigrants who are white or white presenting immigrants saying, you know, we came here later, we didn't have anything to do with this. Well, to be honest, they entered a system already set up for them. Um, Italians, Jews, Armenians, others who, uh, Irish, who had initially were not considered white. This is a little bit aside, but eventually came to be seen as white. They all eventually have benefited from this. And as some of you were here at our prior, um, our prior event, uh, the land grants, the GI Bill, the free, you know, free education, the Homestead Act, all of these programs serve to really propel whites and white society forward at all levels, not just the wealthy, but those who are not wealthy, who became wealthy. And as you may recall, Lane himself and Diane, each of them did very personal, very emotional and, and difficult presentations about how their own families were benefited or were hurt by this. Finally, I want to talk about economists, and I've been reading a lot about what this they call the moral imperative of economists, that e economics, the study of it, is not this neutral, uh, as people like to think, this neutral science. Power and capital played a huge role, obviously a mainstay role in slavery, and it still plays a role in capitalism today. And essentially, Professor Derek Hamilton, who I, I don't quote him, but the, the idea that he brought up is that power and capital adjust to alter the rules and structures of transactions, meaning the markets, to privilege that very power and capital. So it reminds me of a time, uh, it reminds me of, you know, let's say those of us here who run businesses, who work in businesses, imagining having a business where you largely have no labor costs and due to the theft of early land as well from Native Americans, and also by the way, the theft from black farmers, we'll talk about that at, some other stage of land, you know, imagine really running businesses without those costs. It's, uh, it's really something astounding to think of. And that's really what went on back in the day. And finally, I know economics and finance are cold and it makes our eyes roll back in our heads perhaps, but we cannot, we need to sit and figure out how to try and understand this the best we can as non-economists and non-financial people. And I can guarantee you, I am not an economist or a financial person in any sense of the word, but I have tried to link myself to people, economists and academics I trust in order to understand really the depths of, the, of, this, you know, of this situation. So um, one of the things I wanna impress upon you here is Raul, seeing Raul Peck's exterminate all the brutes it's about slavery, but the global colonial theft of land, it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary work and it will help you. It will really help you understand this. Um, next slide, please. So this is just more a reminder of how finance and economics are tied to the base of slavery, of the slavery era, the economic slavery era, and as well as to the reparations movement. Again, we are doing this in aid of understanding why reparations are fundamental to changing the society. And that, you know, 100 million here from Netflix or 150 in scholarships from SoftBank, uh, et cetera, the things we read that companies were doing after the George Floyd, uh, um, uh, after the George Floyd murder, you know, those are choices those companies are making to move one or 2% of their wealth. You know, that is not reparations to me. And frankly, it doesn't totally impress me at all. We'll talk about that near the end. And I'd like all of you to think about that as well. Um, one of the points here is that slave, US slavery itself, the, the production, the entrepreneurs in slavery, they created a lot of the accounting and operational systems that companies use today. And I won't go into those details, but that all of that information is available. And here's, for example, a, an annual record of a planter. You see it says the planter's annual record of his Negroes. This is in 1850 um, and uh, the value of, of, the, of the people at the time. Um, we need to come to terms with the importance of this to really understand the magnitude of the theft and how whites 
whether purposefully or not continue to benefit fully from what was created. Um, next slide, please. Here we go. I mean, this is just reiterating what Farrow said. It's showing there the, uh, the movement of, 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 of between the continents, um, between the US and Europe and the African uh, West Coast. Um, there are American corporations now, and we're going to look at a few that have their roots in the antebellum years, and that is a site of potential redress under reparations. Insurance companies sold policies, um, and which we will we will look at as well, and to under to underwrite the lives of enslaved people, and under also underwrite the slaving voyages. Where, as any of us know who've studied history, we completely know what happened on those ships. There were uprisings, there were people who jumped overboard and commit suicide. So those enslavers and owners and the, and the, the um, owners of those ships or the organizers were compensated for that. Railroads used slave labor and profited from transporting cotton or rice, tobacco, et cetera, that was produced on plantations, what, what I call labor camps or are called by other people as well. Keep in mind the people that were being brought, were kidnapped and brought from the West Coast. Many of them had amazing agricultural skills, in, in particularly around rice and yams and so forth. And they, those people brought those skills to the United States and enslavers knew very well what they were tapping into. It was not just as people like to say labor, although of course there was labor, but there was skill and expertise that came over. Um, next slide, please. I just wanna quickly describe what is a predecessor company. We're gonna see that word. There are companies today that were directly implicated in the slavery era, but really not that many because many of them changed over. So when you look at an entity today and some will talk about, a predecessor company is a company that no longer exists in its original form, but a company now acquired its assets. Those assets were built through the slavery economy, and therefore the company today benefits from that predecessor company. Um, some modern day companies are also benefiting uh, because they came in. A lot of companies will say, well, we didn't exist you know, prior to 1865. Well, if they're in any of those listed categories and many others, they benefited, they opened, their, they opened for business riding a, a boom after emancipation and into the black code area where there was still basically de facto slavery, if not de jure, meaning legal. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to, we wanna look at two areas today. And again, we're just touching on it. There's really no way to do justice to the depth of this, but essentially um, in my view, at least in my research, I won't say it started with the California Department of Insurance. They have a slavery era insurance registry, which we're gonna look at. A lot of material that we know today about the bankers and particularly the insurers came out of their requirement, which we'll discuss later, of companies having to disclose their slavery era ties if they wanna do business in California. Now I can guarantee you the Aetnas and the MetLifes and all the names of the big insurers that we know, the AIGs, they have to do business in California because it's a huge market. So we're going to be looking a bit at, 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 at the details. Um, and all of this is leading up again to the Q&A with Trevor to discuss these and maybe in broader strokes. Um, next slide, please. So here we look at New York Life, which we all know that it's all, these are almost household names, right? So I just wanna to touch on a few points here, which you can also read. Essentially, they reported to the state of California that they have a predecessor called Nautilus Insurance Company. It began writing insurance policies in 1850, uh, sorry, 1845 for a period of two years until their trustees voted to end those types of policies. But nonetheless, 339 of the first 1,000 policies written by Nautilus were on the lives of enslaved people. And these policies were for about 500 or less for a term of one year. And then we talk about the numbers of people and the, the claims that were made just on these policies. Now, keep in mind, this research and the reporting to California, and, and again, to a few other states, which we'll go into, is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's what we, it's what, 
it's what those companies were forced to do to, to research, to disclose to California in order to do business there. Um, next slide, please. Here's Charter Oak Life, which still exists. I bring up this quote, the company, uh, this is a quote by, um, it's in a, I'm sorry, I didn't put the full context. It's in a, an article in the New York Times, which you can find online called Slave Policies, but it's written by Matthew McGill, who was a Kentucky-based agent for a Hartford-based insurer. And this was in a pamphlet where they were trying to get the drum up business in six Southern states. And he said, the company is by no means solicitous of securing a large Negro insurance business unless the owners are careful and judicial men. So he's really saying, you know, we want your business, but we're only going to do business with whatever, you know, he determined were the careful and judicial enslavers. So there's some irony in, uh, to, this, to this comment. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have AIG, another huge multi, you know, multinational. It acquired a company in 2001, as you saw, that comprised 17 insurers licensed to do business in California. Of the 17, as reported to the slavery era registry in California, the Department of Insurance, only one of them called United States Life Insurance Company, which was in New York, did business during the slavery era. Now, when I say only, again, keep in mind, this is the tip of the iceberg and only what they were required to report. Now, AIG did research and they located a magazine article that contained a replica of, of a policy of a CG. And it was on the life of a man named Charles for 550. And it's interesting when you look at the exclusion. So some of us know when we buy insurance policies, you know, we won't cover flooding, we won't cover this, we won't cover that. In this case, the exclusions were death to said slave by means of any invasion, insurrection, riot, civil commotion, or any other military or usurped power, or in case the slave shall die by his own hand, or in consequence of a duel, or by the hands of justice, this policy shall be null, void, and have no effect. So you see, when they talk about the hands of justice, what are they talking about? If this man named Charles tried to escape and was killed in a slave patrol operation to go try and get him back, he wouldn't be covered. So again, it's interesting to think about really how, the, how these, um, the, all these exclusions, including the exclusions related to slave, to the uprisings of enslaved people, they were not covered in this case. Next slide, please. Here, Aetna, a very, you know, well-known company to this day. They filed their report to California on behalf of four companies authorized to do business in California. Um, one of them, they uncovered seven policies. You can read that here. Uh, they produced a list of 16 first names of enslaved people called from those policies. Uh, again, interestingly, and we'll, we'll look at this quickly when we actually look at the report from California, some of the name, most of the names of the enslaved people were a first name. When you saw a second name, and you'll see some of these, it means that in touching on what Farrell said, there was a huge internal US internal movement of enslaved people being sold from one enslaver to the next, moving uh, as, the cotton, as the cotton industry grew. So they end up taking the name of their first enslaver, and you might see a second name on the ledger book. Um, Next, next uh, slide, please. This is, um, I'm sorry you can't see it very well. This is embedded in the California slavery era registry report. I will urge each of you when you can to go read that report and read what's in there. There are a lot of primary documents like this. So this, just in case you can't see it well, is a list of insurance premiums by age of the enslaved person together with any extra premiums like for mining, mining and other uh, steamboats where a lot where enslaved people were forced to work and where there was a high chance of injury or death. And again, this is a reminder that this document is an original that is part of the California Department of Insurance Slavery Era Registry. Um, next slide, please. 
I'm looking now, we're looking now, uh, moving from insurance to financial entities, again, names we know very well. Um, in 2005, so JP Morgan Chase was one of, was the, the largest bank at the time. It admitted the two of its subsidiaries, not even predecessors, but subsidiaries, meaning existing in the moment, uh, had accepted enslaved people as collateral for loans. Now, as, as we know, what is collateral? It means if you have a loan and you don't pay up, you have a house and you don't pay your mortgage, eventually the bank takes it back. Well, enslaved people were put up as collateral. Now, if plantation owners defaulted, they took the enslaved people. So what does that mean in reality? When you read the book by Edward Batiste and other uh, mem memoirs uh, of, of the lives of enslaved people, they were moved around like pawns in this. Again, families were, families were torn apart because of this. This, when you read it, sounds cold and calculating and economics, but basically this is what happened to people. They were taken by the bank, who knows what happened to them, where they were sent um, and so forth. An interesting uh, note, note please, the, the, the source here. So there's this article, but also in New York City, there's something called the Inside Out Tours and they run a New York City slavery and underground railroad tour that really links Wall Street to slavery in a way that probably many people don't know. And out of that, I also was able to confirm that New York, New York City probably received 40% of all the US cotton revenue through money from its financial institutions, shipping and insurance companies. And I again, it goes back to Farrell's point that no one in the North can just look at the South and poo poo them as backward, you know, former enslavers. The whole of the North is completely is completely engaged or was completely engaged and today I would argue is still engaged because they grew from this. Um, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Bank of America, all the banks were with, they are all uh, well-known US firms that benefited from the slave trade. Again, those are things that you can research and find yourself. Um, next slide, please. Um, here is another one that essentially, um, this one I find so interesting. So the Daily Journal of Commerce, which happens to be in Oregon, in 2002, a shareholder in Fleet Boston Financial sent in a complaint about um, this uh, very large lawsuit, a series of lawsuits that were going on seeking damages for the descendants of African-American enslaved people from Fleet Boston and other institutions. The response um, was from, um, Edward Fagan in Livingston and he, uh, sorry, no, Edward Fagan was the attorney filing the suits. I'm sorry, I can't see the entire, uh, the entire thing here, but basically this was the response to that complaining shareholder. They say that, they say that this is the, the, an example of legal system run amok, meaning these slavery reparations cases, um, Fleet Boston, its officers, directors, and shareholders and depositors wouldn't know a slave if one bit them on the nose. This is in quotes from, uh, I believe it's lower down um, in the, um, why can't we see it? Hold on a second, because I want, let me find it, because I'd like you guys to be able to, to, to research this. One second, please. Yes, so the, uh, the lawyer or the response was, that this is an example of the legal system run amok. However, according to the suit, Fleet Boston was a successor to Providence Bank and Providence Bank founded by slave trader John Brown, uh, allegedly, allegedly, he says. So in other words, he doesn't believe the facts. There are documents that they lent money to John Brown uh, to enable him to finance his slave business, which had to do with shipping and many other things. Um, so he uses the word alleged. Then he continues the response to this complaining shareholder, quote, Fagan intends to file close to 100 additional lawsuits against large U.S. corporations for damages in excess of trillions of dollars, which is true. That is what happened. The, the, uh, the, the, the cases were lost and you can review them. But here's his aside. I wonder if Fagan will sue Egypt for enslaving the Hebrews and forcing them to build pyramids. So I go back to this, my initial comment, which is there's this a sense of um, poo-pooing 
without understanding the depths of this. And I think that poo-pooing the, the, the role of slavery in building all this up. And I think that comment uh, really go, that sarcasm goes to that point. Next, um, next uh, slide, please. Here's Chase Manhattan again. Chase Manhattan, it has two predecessors, the Merchants Bank of New York, the Leather Manufacturers Bank of New York. They were listed as the exclusive bankers. I remember the time period, 1852, a 2.5 million venture in writing enslaved slave insurance, life insurance policies on the enslaved. So here we have banking and insurance together. They invested, as we say here in this company out of London, that wrote policies on the lives of enslaved people in DC, Virginia, and North Carolina. You see how specific the details are. Um, and we name here some by name, some very uh, well-known and the wealthiest individuals who are on the board of directors of this venture. I want you to note the source here. The testimony is attorney Deidre Farmer Pellman. She, is, she went to law school to do slavery reparations, class action lawsuits, and she was a lead plaintiff in this case in 2004. There is a lot of information about her. Uh, she has a, a reparations organization. I tried to get her to join us. She was unavailable, but you can find lots of information about her and everything she's done. Uh, she's done. Um, please uh, go to the next slide. Now, in uh, in um, uh, Raoul Peck's Exterminate All the Brutes, he talks about a Haitian anthropologist, Michel Rolf Trouillot. He wrote a book called Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History. Um, I think the title speaks for itself. He's a, he, he, again, is from Haiti, and he looks at this in a global and colonial way, and all, obviously touching on, on um, slavery. He said, the ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility, and the ultimate challenge is exposing the roots. I would say that that exactly exemplifies the issue with what we're talking about today, that the mark of power, in this case, white supremacy and all its related uh, entities, want to make this invisible. And our challenge is to expose it in the face of people having a lot of difficulty kind of paying attention and had taking an interest, people in Congress, people who have power to change this situation. Um, so I just think that this particular book and this particular person, um, Mr., uh, Mr. Dr. Trouillot, um, speaks to that point. And the question I'm going to be talking with um, Trevor about, in part, is why why is this erasure? I think it's obvious, but I think it's worth talking, you know, putting it out there. And and how do we counteract it? Next slide, please. Now, this is a document that has become my Bible. I'm going to show it to you. It's here. I just wanna talk briefly about it. I believe Catherine has put it in the chat and I would urge, urge, urge you to go look at this document. It, I explain what it is here. The section of it, 138013, says the descendants of slaves whose ancestors were defined as property, dehumanized, divided from their families, and whose ancestors' owners, owners were compensated for damage by the insurers are entitled to full disclosure. Notice what's embedded in there. I mentioned it before, but I'll say it again. After at emancipation and after, enslavers lost their property. Let's look at it that way, they were compensated and repaired, not every single one, and repaired for their loss. Imagine that. And imagine at the same time, the enslaved people freed, promised 40 acres and a mule and whatnot. There's a history of, of reparations claims from before 1865, which you can look at. Um, essentially, they didn't. And so California, God bless them, <laughs> Had, took it upon themselves to put it out there. They are linking the past to the present. They are providing a through line uh, through, le through legislation and regulation. What I want to point out here, when you go to look at this document, it has a full report, but it also lists all of the individual policies by number when possible. So you look at this, if you can see it, I'm sorry if it's not clear, there are 50 page. 57 pages of slaveholder names. You see the names, 
you see their county, you see the name of the enslaved person and you see their county, you see what, the, what job they did, what labor they were forced to, to do, what they were insured for. And then you see that that information was submitted in, in this case, for example, New York Life Insurance. So these are all listed A to Z. Some pages have just the name of one, in, one insurer. There's one where it's a mill and they just have pages, pages and pages of, um, of, of, uh, of policies. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, before we talk about this slave, in that same report, there's a list of the enslaved, 47 pages. They are in likewise listed A to Z, and it's the name of the enslaved person, where they were, what their job, and what they were insured, what they were insured to do. And going back to the enslaver, for example, in, um, in the report, in this listing, there's a um, Richard Bradley of Savannah, and William Burke of North Carolina, they had 11 policies uh, for, for, for enslaved people they owned who worked in their sawmill. So it's a few, it's pages and pages of New York Life Insurance Company policies. Um, they also had cooks, laborers. I'm looking now at the types of jobs. Um, and, and so the question I have, which I wanted to, which I'd like to discuss is, we have everything we need to identify families, businesses. And when you read about reparations, particularly William Darity, Professor William Darity, an economist who's considered the father of reparations, of the reparations movement now, along with uh, other very fundamental organizations, you know, he talks about, uh, he talks about, yes, federal government, local government, they need to pay up. But there's also companies and private families. I'm afraid to say it, but these people have seemed to have been kept safe. But their information is out there. All of these enslavers have descendants. Well, where are they now? How much did they inherit? How wealthy are they now? Or if they're not wealthy, you know, what are they doing now? What were they able to accomplish because of this? And um, so that's something we have to think about. The, the information, everything we need is out there. We need to figure out how to have Congress or the courts, the courts have failed so far, move this along and get reparations for the descendants of these enslaved people who are in this one report. Imagine what else is out there. Let's continue uh, to, I think, the second to last slave and then we'll, we'll uh, launch into our, our Q&A. Um, this is an example of, uh, and we're only gonna touch on this, a number of, of states and cities, and Detroit is the latest very recently, maybe last month or in June, they've decided to launch a reparations committee. Um, Chicago requires vendors in certain industries who, that want to do business with the city of Chicago, they have to disclose their slavery era business. So I put up an example here of, of their regulation for this, and you can go online and find the actual form and what it asks and what these vendors have to disclose or and provide the city in order for the city to approve them as vendors. Uh, they're called, I guess in, in Chicago, they might be called affidavits, but you know, Connecticut has some, other, other places in Illinois have it. There are a number of states and cities, not enough by any measure, but they're out there. And what they do is they lift the veil on what really no one has wanted to really discuss. And when I say no one, I mean white families, you know, wealthy families, white, uh, white companies, white owned companies, multinationals. Uh, and I think this, this is really the heart of it. Uh, next slide, unless there are none left. This might be the last one. This is the last one. Oh, thank you, Adam. Thank you. So anyway, I, I haven't had a chance to look in the chat. You can take this down, um, Adam. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, but I hope people will. Uh, we're going to be. We're going to have plenty of time to talk. So those of you feeling antsy and feeling emotional, which includes me, um, we'll have a chance to get things off our chest 
and also push back. I mean, push back on me, push back on Trevor, push back on others if you want to. Um, but um, anyway, um, Trevor, hello. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How is everyone else this morning? Excellent. Well, I'm good, and I hope everyone else is. I want to give Trevor a chance to um, present himself. He's just going to take a few minutes. He may be doing other work with us in the future. He's quite an amazing person. I have to say, I'm just going to, I know, Trevor, I don't want to steal your thunder, but he has a, a, a newsletter or a, a blog called Reparations Daily-ish, which I recently found and joined immediately. Um, he puts out the most wonderful and informative information. Um, and this is what led me to him. And I'm very happy that we were able to find Trevor. So Trevor, go ahead and talk a little bit about yourself and then we'll, we'll just launch into the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Jordana. And hey, everyone, um, appreciate you all being here this morning and I'm glad to be with you. And so um, as Jordana said, my name is Trevor Smith. Um, I'm calling in from New York City. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm originally from Germantown, Maryland. I'm a first generation American. My parents are from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Um, so I'm coming to this specific work, uh, the work of reparations here in the United States um, as an ally, um, because I believe that uh, reparations here um, in the United States should go to those who are the descendants of the formerly enslaved. Um, so again, I'm coming into this work as an ally um, and I think that's not to say that I don't believe that reparations are owed kind of across the Black diaspora from a variety of act actors, um, but I'm coming into this specific work as an ally and just always kind of say that up front. Uh, for work, I am currently a program associate at the Surgeon Foundation. Um, the Surgeon Foundation is a 100 plus year old uh, racial and social justice foundation, uh, family foundation based here in New York. Um, and I sit on the inclusive economies team. And so we have um, a $9 million grant making portfolio um, that we uh, dole out every year to organiza organizations seeking to create a more equitable economy. And it's been very interesting to work in philanthropy, um, considering the way that wealth was created in this country and working for a social justice foundation. And so um, I've been there for a year and a half and it's been a very interesting um, place to learn, grow, and um, obviously try to create a more uh, equitable world. I will be starting as the director of narrative change at Liberation Ventures, which is a new social venture um, that is seeking to expand the field of reparations through four levers. And I will drop uh, their link um, into the chat so you can uh, read a little bit more about them. Um, obviously, it's a it's a social startup, so we're always looking for, um, you know, donations and, and the like. And so, um, would love your and so as a director of narrative change, I will be creating what we're calling the Reparations Narrative Lab, um, which is essentially a space for the organizations that are uh, the grassroots organizations that are working on reparations on a day to day basis to come together, kind of be grounded in the theory of narrative change, learn about the history of narrative change throughout the reparations movement, and then co-create reparation strategy, uh, narrative change strategies uh, together. And so um, I'm very excited about that and I'll be starting in two weeks. Um, I'm also an active writer, researcher, and I would say a, a cultural strategist around the issues of the racial wealth gap and reparations. Um, Dr. Uh, Darity have, has been named a couple of times. I'll definitely bring him up um, in some of my answers um, during the Q&A, and so I've been published um, in some research alongside him that kind of examined the role, um, examine uh, how much, uh, the, the, examining the cost of what a reparations plan could uh, look like here in the United States, and so I'll drop that into the chat in a second as well, and then I've also been published um, in some outlets such as the American Prospect, USA Today, and Business Insider, and so I'll likely touch on those um, articles throughout um, the Q&A and so I'll drop them into the chat as well and so I just really appreciate you all having me today and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So um, thanks Trevor and uh, we're very grateful to have you and to have your time. Um, just to tell everyone after Trevor and I are, are, are done with our chat um, we will have time to talk and I also want to remind people as we've done with other events and Trevor you're welcome to leave right at the end or stay we have a kind of an after party where whoever wants to stay can stay. And we kind of have a free flowing back and forth. I intend to stay. 
Um, and, um, and, and we usually, it, it, some of the best stuff often comes out there. Uh, so I just wanted to remind people that if you can stay a little bit, you might enjoy that. So um, Trevor, I want to touch on some points from Pharaoh's presentation and from mine. And I also, and, and, and I want it to be somewhat free flowing, but I want to give context to the question. So I want to go back to uh, Dr. Truyo, uh, his comment uh, from his book that history is the fruit of power and the ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility and the challenges to expose the roots. So this idea of separating the slavery era from today or trying to erase its role in slavery, you know, building contemporary US wealth to me is an example of power dictating history. The power structure today wants to just set it aside. It's old, let's not worry about it. Oh, by the way, I just wanna remind people, Catherine is dropping each question in the chat. So as you, if you wanna read it to remind yourself, uh, please do. And thanks Kath Catherine for that. So my question to you is, you know, which might seem obvious, but again, we should give we should bring it into the light and the air, is why is this erasure or diminishing of the role of sla the slavery economy? Why has it happened and how do we counteract it? I know it's a big question, uh, but if you can just touch on your thoughts. Yeah, um, so I think, yeah, you, you started to get into it a little bit. You know, those who hold power, um, you know, realize the importance of whitewashing history. And so I think this question really touches on uh, what's going on right now with this kind of um, anti-critical race theory moment that we're seeing across the country. You know, you have five states um, that have signed anti-critical race theory legislation into law, and I think at least a dozen others that have um, proposed similar bills. And so um, only a handful of these bills, I think, actually mention critical race theory by name in the legislation. And so I think it's a perfect example of why it's a Trojan horse. Um, you know, the, most of the bills actually condemn and somehow and sometimes penalize the teaching of history, um, the teaching of facts as it pertains to race and its impact on today's society. Um, some states have particularly targeted um, New York Times and Nicole Hannah Jones' The 1619 Project. Um, I read an article last week about a teacher in the South who, um, I think it was, I want to say Georgia, who lost his job because he introduced his students to uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Case on Reparations. And so I think the answer to this question um, is, um, you know, the folks who are in power are really trying to, um, you know, uh, make sure that things like Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Case for Reparations and Nicole Hannah Jones' 1619 Project um, which distill history in, I think, a very digestible way and change the, the common narrative that we're taught in school around slavery, race, reconstruction, and white supremacy. Um, and white supremacy is a term that um, I wasn't really introduced to in a school setting. I'm sure a lot of us on this call weren't introduced to in a school setting. And so folks are really trying to make sure that um, pieces like that um, aren't in the classroom because they speak truth to power. And so I think that phrase speaks, uh, the phrase uh, speak truth to power originated um, from the Quakers and it was a call to the United States to stand firmly against all forms of fascism. And so today uh, speaking truth to power can look like a lot of things, but most notably in the, uh, in the kind of bucket on race and racism, um, it's really naming that this country was built on stolen indigenous land, by stolen African labor. And okay. so that sentence is a fact, um, that sentence is a truth, but yet um, it makes people uncomfortable. Um, and you know, it really goes against this narrative that we're taught about American exceptionalism, um, that our founding fathers were geniuses. Um, and so uh, speaking truth to power, um, you know, scares people and it scares the people who are in power, which are generally white men. Um, and so, um, I think that's, you know, the, the reason why they do it is because um, they know that um, speaking truth to power will actually uh, bring to light the things um, that will empower people to, to create change. And um, how do we counteract it? That's what I hope to kind of do um, in my new role at Liberation Ventures as the director of narrative change, um, kind of push back against these dominant narratives um, around American exceptionalism, around this idea of the American dream and actually uh, create new narratives that actually tell the truth about um, the United States. And I feel right. like if we can do that, right. um, then we can build power to, to pass policy. 
And also it sounds like the reparations narrative lab just to follow up is gonna be gathering, like the gathering the strength of many grassroots and other organizations that eventually it's a, it's a power source, right? So, exactly, that's okay. exactly how I envision it, yeah. Okay, that's excellent. So I wanna to touch on uh, this idea of economics, accounting, you know, financial tools, how they, actually some were actually created within the, the slavery era economy and they're completely embedded in capitalism now in the, in the US economy and its, and its wealth generating uh, engine. Um, but those are like dry topics. You know, we, we look at police brutality and other things that really s spark, you know, the imaginations and the, the emotions of people but I think this should be sparking emotions in people. And my question to you is, given how either people don't have the patience to just, they're like, I'm not an economist. I don't know anything about running a business. I can't, I can't learn this stuff. I, I just can't. How do we get people, particularly white people, to be able to pay attention so that we, meaning me and white, as white people, come to understand exactly what happened and how we, as white people, continue to benefit today, whether we want to or not, whether we like it or not, and whether we're aware of it or not. Right. Uh, so I think this is the golden question. And I don't think there is one distinct answer in terms of how do we get white people to, to pay attention. I think um, there's variety of answers and a variety of uh, methods that are going to have to go into it. But I think that's the golden question. And so uh, Liberation Ventures has actually done some polling and um, we're going to do a larger poll soon that found a few things that the poll that was already done. So it found that a majority of U.S. voters support a national reparations policy, including um, seven in 10 white voters under the age of 45. It found that most white women support a national reparations policy um, and then along with 44 percent of white men. And it found that 88% of Black voters and 60% of Latino voters would support reparations. And so this may come as a surprise to you, um, but I think it, it, it was all in the way that the, the question was phrased. Um, so the question was phrased as reparations um, in the forms of investments into the Black community for affordable housing, healthcare and wellness, educational scholarships, loan forgiveness, and business development. And so support dropped when... Um, uh, when the question was just around cash payments. And so I think there, that's, you know, the, that's kind of the debate on like what reparations is and uh, what it should be. I think that should be determined from those who were harmed. I personally think that it should be in the form of cash payments in, in addition to, to other things. But um, to get white support, I think we need to create this like a reparative environment. And so I think as the polling shows, white people are more in favor of um, uplifting the black community when it's um, in the form of affordable housing or educational scholarships or loan forgiveness. And so I think engaging in those conversations um, will be super important, one. And then um, I think we, you know, we also need to uh, think about what Derek Bell said. You know, we talked about critical race theory before. And so Derek Bell is one of the uh, founding fathers of critical race theory. And he came up with this term called the interest convergence theory. And that found that black people will only achieve civil rights when the interests of white people and black people converge. And mm -hmm. so his, the, the signature example of this is kind of Brown v. Board, um, you know, which happened because it also uh, advanced white interests too. And some of the biggest winners um, of aff affirmative action like to this day have been white women. So what I will say is that, you know, in the fight for reparations, we're going to have to get white people to see and understand and most importantly feel that this will also benefit them. Um, you know, I truly believe that reparations is a form of healing to this country and um, it will actually set it on the path to live up to the ideals that um, it espoused in the constitution and the declaration of independence. Um, you know, the declaration of independence said all men, you know, I think we should amend it to say all people are created equally. Um, that they're endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I think reparations actually sets us forth on that path. And I think we need to, the, we have to get white people to understand that. And that is how we do that is the hard part. Um, and it will take like a multitude of strategies. So uh, uh, thank you. And thank you for the statistics you gave us. So my next question kind of rolls into what you've said. And I want to bring up 
uh, the economist, uh, Professor uh, William Darity, who I know uh, you, you have written with and, and you know, uh, just so for those of you who haven't heard of him, his book is called From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. He literally, uh, he goes through the history, but he has a section that he literally goes through what he proposes to be the method, which I find interesting. Remember, I, I said at the beginning, we can have all the knowledge and research we want. If we don't activate it, it, it just sits, it, it sits there and does nothing. And I think uh, Professor Darity actually has a plan to activate it. And um, he's considered in, in, by many to be a, the, a, the current, the father of the current reparations movement. He describes in his book, what was lost through slavery and black code and Jim Crow. He talks about labor and property, education and skills building, esteem and empowerment, life, liberty, and dignity. He said that the slave redress movement has to focus less on victims and more on the perpetrators and their beneficiaries. So keep that in mind when whites say, well, I wasn't involved. Though you're not a perpetrator, but you are a beneficiary. And, and so he's saying we have to shift the focus there. So my question to you, uh, uh, Trevor, is when whites, and you've heard the argument say, we've ha I had nothing to do with slavery. You know, I'm, I'm not a rich person. I'm an immigrant uh, who arrived when, you know, whenever. Uh, well after slavery, like, why should I be punished? You, we hear that language that they, a lot of white people see reparations as a punishment to them for something they say they're not involved in and that it, it, they even say they don't benefit from it. So I was wondering what you think about that. Yeah, and so I just dropped into the chat, um, volume Absolutely. 31 of uh, Reparations Daily-ish, which was um, a Q&A with Dr. Darity. Um, I've been connected to him for a couple of years. He's, I would consider him a mentor of mine. Very, very nice guy. I just reached out to him over Twitter and uh, we had a convers our co first conversation. And since then, he's brought me on to projects. And so I really appreciate his thoughts on this work. And a lot of what, you know, I say um, really does come from him. And so I'll respond in the way that I think Dr. Darity would respond, which is that the racial wealth gap is the cumulative and most telling effect of centuries of past racist policies and structural racism. And so white people hold 10 times, 10 times the amount of wealth than black people do. And we've seen throughout the, the pandemic how important wealth is when you might lose a job or you might have, uh, you know, healthcare bills that just stack up. <laughs> having generational wealth is there to serve as a cushion. Uh, you know, I've, you know, also, I've personally, you know, I've seen um, folks, you know, start at, the, I go to the same high school, we study the same thing, and I come out of university and grad school with tons of debt, and they come out, you know, uh, in the green. Um, they, their parents, you know, they got to live at home um, while they went to school, their parents paid for their education. And so they come out in the green, even though we were on very similar tracks, we went to the same high school, we studied the same, we had the same major, but then coming out of college, we're in very different positions. And so the racial wealth gap, I think, is the cumulative effect of centuries of past racist policy. And so I think the argument um, that, you know, it's not my fault, or it wasn't, you know, it's not my ancestors, I think it's most likely to come from white people who come from um, kind of lower socioeconomic classes because it's hard for them to see the effects of structural racism maybe in their everyday lives. Um, because when they look at their bank accounts or when they look at their salaries, they don't feel as if they have benefited from previous uh, racist legislation um, or they don't feel as if they benefit from their white skin. And I, I guess I can understand that, but it's you know not really the truth. Um, you know, yes, there are white people who are out there who may not have accumulated wealth directly because of slavery, but white people are in a better position to attain wealth because we live in a society that's dominated by white supremacy. Um, so studies have found that black applicants are half as likely to receive a callback um, or a job offer as equally qualified white applicants. Black men with no criminal record fared no better in the labor market than white men who were just released from prison. Um, wow. Uh, a survey of employers found that the reasons um, that they cited for not hiring black men were lack of work ethics, self-presentation, uh, self a threatening or criminal demeanor. Um, you know, I think 
folks may have read, read it too. I read a recent article that black, a black family's home appraisal went up $92,000 after taking out all signs in their house that they were a black family. And so the perception of black people really impacts them in their daily lives in a way that it doesn't, in a way that white people in their skin doesn't impact them in the, negatively in their daily lives. Right. So the implicit bias that is still there within society impacts black people. And so, um, you know, your ancestors may not, may not have ever owned black people or you may have immigrated here, but that debt is owed from the American government from instituting ra uh, past racist policies and creating this atmosphere of anti-blackness that still affects black people today. Right. Um, you know, what's really curious and what's really funny to me is that no one really complains about how their tax dollars are used um, in other kind of frivolous ways. You know, our tax dollars go to Trump's Space Force. You know, there's an actual Space Force. Um, our tax dollars, you know, I was looking into this before the call, um, our tax dollars go to Ivy League colleges. Um, you know, despite the fact that they have billions of dollars in their endowments, between yeah. 2017 and 2019, the eight Ivy Leagues received $9.8 billion in federal grants. So yeah. no one complains about these things, but when it comes to giving black people agency, when it comes to righting a wrong, then it's wasteful spending. Oh, don't use my tax dollars in that way. Oh, don't use my money in that way. It's not my fault. But the government uses money, our money in all sorts of ways that I may not necessarily agree with, but that's what is part of being in a democracy. Um, and then I should add that, you know, no one also says anything about reparations that were given to Japanese people, um, you know, after in, uh, they were uh, sent to internment camps. Um, and so there's this large layer of anti-Blackness that comes up when talking about reparations um, in the, for Black people. Um, and so I think that um, that's another layer that we have to deconstruct uh, mm -hmm. as we talk to white people about why reparations are needed. Right. Um, thank you for that. I also just wanted to add to what you were saying. Um, the pet, you you talked about the, the the wealth gap has really appeared, uh, you know, in an exorbitant way during the pandemic. So, for example, the Washington Post on May twenty fifth, twenty twenty, reported that the number of working Black business owners fell forty percent, far more than any other group. And the second thing I want to point out because I'm very um, incensed with banks, is uh, June 4th, 2020, US banks took 11.7 billion, billion in overdraft fees in 2019. Now, what does that mean? This is while banks are, are, are giving away 150 million in scholarships. They collected 9% of, of um, account holders with $350 or less in a balance paid 84% of those fees to banks. And of course, when you look deeply into the statistics and uh, according to this um, newspaper article in the New York Times, the people most affected are clearly poorer people of all races, but lots of people who are black and, and, Lat and Latinx. So they paid banks and the banks closed their accounts and then continued to still um, build up their deficit of these $35, you know, uh, um, uh, overdraft fees. So I don't know about you, but all of this, you know, post George Floyd, you know, we're going to do this and that, that's the next thing I'm going to look into. But I don't think, and, and like you said, Trevor, it is the people affected who should be able to dictate how they want to receive their reparations. And again, I would suggest that 150 million here, 100 million here, where or the set, you know, um, the businesses are deciding how they want what they consider to be repairing or helping. To me, should not be figure into a discussion of reparations. That's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just wanted to add that to what you said. I also wanted to ask your opinion. Um, in my presentation, I talked about Chicago and California and these disclosure requirements. I think, I mean, they got press at the time and I think there needs to be more of them. You know, Detroit is gonna start a reparations committee from what, what I've been reading. How influential are those though? Because we are talking about state and city governments putting it all out there now and requiring people who wanna do business with them to disclose. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah. And so I just dropped into a chat, into the chat, um, a Q and A that I did with Dr. Andre Perry of the Brookings Institute, yeah. um, where we kind of talk about this. Um, so if folks kind of want to dig into that a little bit more. We talk about it there. Um, this idea of local reparations. And so Dr. Darity uh, is actually very against local reparations. Um, he's yeah. very adamant that uh, reparations should come from the federal government. Um, you know, he often says that the uh, total. Uh, the total, the total amount of state budgets combined, um, you know, isn't enough to close the racial wealth gap, uh, you know, with our calculations. And so um, I'm looking for another article that we wrote where we calculate, um, we calculated it in a, in a report, but then I kind of uh, distilled it down into uh, an op-ed in Business Insider where um, we give uh, various figures into how much, um, uh, reparations are owed. And so the, the figure that I like to use is the $12 trillion figure. And that, um, that really um, is calculated based off of what 40 acres and a mule would be today. And so that would give each descendant um, of the enslaved $254,000. Um, so the idea of local reparations, you know, I go back and forth. Um, I think local efforts are needed. I think we need to create like a reparative economy, um, a reparative yeah. society. Um, but I, I, kind of would lean toward Dr. Darity in terms of reparation should come from the federal government um, or should be led by the federal government. Um, but, you know, I, I can't really fault, you know, uh, private institutions for, um, you know, looking back into their history and being open about it. You know, we've seen universities like Georgetown identify the descendants of people who were who the university sold to keep it alive. And then they offered free enroll, um, enrollment and free tuition to, to the descendants of, uh, of those who they um, sold. You know, we've seen churches acknowledge the role of slavery in their congregations. You know, we've seen cities like Evanston, Illinois, um, mm -hmm. kind of do what I would call maybe like a housing reparations. Um, you know, they're kind of uh, um, calling to part uh, their role in redlining, and um, you know, they're giving um, they they're giving uh, funds to black people um, in Evanston, but it can only be used for down payment on a house. Um, and so I think these local efforts are needed to create the groundswell um, so that we can, you know, uh, eventually see something happen at the federal level. You know, um, I think with other kind of uh, large policy changes, that's what generally happens. It kind of uh, grows from the bottom and then eventually reaches Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., where we see federal legislation. And so um, that's why I'm really um, adamant about culture change. Um, I think it's uh, we need. A public private we need public private and philanthropic support to change how people view reparations so that reparative efforts can be made across the country but we mm -hmm. do need to be really clear on what we mean by reparations um, yeah. so I'm, I'm fine for all these reparative efforts but you know i think you know i've seen some things like like mutual aid where folks are you know just sending a uh you know donating to an organization or sending someone money and they're calling that reparations i think that's I, I don't think that's reparations. And I think that's very dangerous because it actually waters down mm -hmm. what reparations are. And so exactly. we have to be super careful about it. Um, you know, there's debate. I'm happy to like engage in conversation and debate around whether we need local reparations, whether we need, whether we need federal reparations. Is, are they, is local reparations such a thing? Um, where I stand is that I think most of the things that we're seeing happening on the local, state, and like personal level are reparative and that reparations itself should probably come from the federal government. And so I wanted to add something, this, I, this word, the word reparations kind of bothers me. It has repair in it. And when you repair something, it means it was once whole and it broke. This was never whole, it's always been broken. And um, I don't know, I just wanted to put that out there to make you know that word reparations, uh, even that word doesn't really work for me. It, based on what I said, I wanted to point out, you gave examples, you know, Brown University and so forth. Again, they are choosing the way they are choosing the way they want to repair, which I think is wrong. Um, if you guys look up the Virginia Theological Seminary in Northern Virginia, um, it's a very interesting case because they actually did approach the descendants of the people that they sold and they asked, what do you want? And they allowed the people damaged and affected to decide. And they've actually started issuing monthly checks. Now, I, I want to be clear. My personal opinion is 
things can never be repaired. The damage is so deep and so wide and so generational and what was taken from people, opportunities, you can't even repair it in my view, but we, have to, we do have to start somewhere and the US rolls on money. So let's do that and, and, help, and help close the gap. But fundamentally the destruction, the separation of families, et cetera, over all those centuries can't be repaired in my view. So um, I had one more question for you, which is part of your research as well. Um, and it relates to Professor Darity saying that reparations can't succeed until the animosity of whites, quote, is not only reduced, but converted to support. Mm -hmm. And then I also wanted to link to that the role of truth and memory. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wondered what you think of what he said. He's essentially saying, if we can't get whites on board, this isn't going to happen. Right. And, and also, where does truth and memory come in, which is also a big push of Diane and our group in having in lay, you know, talking about things and giving air to them so that we can move on into action. Right. Yeah. And so this is um, what I hope to kind of dive into a little bit more um, in my new role as the director of narrative change at Liberation Ventures, where I'll be starting in a couple of weeks. And so, um, you know, I fully agree that this can't happen without white people. You know, I think um, the way I think about um, narrative change and, and kind of getting people on board is that you have uh, you have your choir which is essentially folks who have joined us here today who are probably in agreement. I'm assuming everyone here is likely in agreement that reparations are owed to black people. So that's the choir, right? The folks who, you know, agree with us already. Then you have your base of supporters who I think are, uh, you know, generally uh, aware of uh, racial inequities. They generally support racial justice, but you know, it's not top of mind for them essentially. Um, and then you have the persuadables, which AKA moderates, um, which could go either way. Um, and so I think what, what uh, it's really important that we expand our base and that we move uh, by, by moving some of the folks from uh, the persuadables into the base and that we increase the choir. And so increasing that choir um, will also uh, need to uh, 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 bring in other people of color. Um, and so we really need to create a multiracial coalition of folks yeah. together across the finish line. And so that means we need our Latinx brothers and sisters, we need our Asian brothers and sisters, our indigenous brothers and sisters to advocate for this because, um, you know, there's, you know, three imperatives to this work. It's there's a democratic imperative an economic imperative and a more imperative. And so Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative said that reparations is for all of us. Um, if you've harmed someone, you have to do things to become healthy and whole. Um, that's the case for reparations. For me, it's all about how society heals from injustice. And so that's what Brian Stevenson said. Um, I think you brought, uh, brought up a really good po uh, point, Jordana, about um, the, the concept of repair and you know, even where it stems from, the Latin word uh, reparare uh, means to, to um, uh, put back in order to restore. And so I think you made a really good point there. Um, but I, I would generally agree with Brian Stevenson that, you know, reparations is for all of us. You know, this is a societal issue um, because the societal harm has been has been caused um, and that impacts our democracy, our economy and our social lives and how we interact with each other. And so um, anti-blackness really, you know, shaped America. Uh, it's really steeped within America. And so um, naming that and bringing people along and naming that and then naming reparations as a solution, I think is really important and important. And so in his book, um, From Here to Equality, Darity also talks about the role of repairing the national memory and consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm currently writing, um, I guess I just finished it, thank thankfully, it took like two years. Um, I was writing a chapter in a book that Darity's putting together um, that takes like a multidisciplinary look at reparations in various sectors. So there's a housing chapter, a criminal justice chapter, Etc. And so my chapter focuses on media and it, it examines how Black people have historically been negatively portrayed and demonized um, through various forms within the media landscape. And then also how um, essentially like Black art um, and Black intellectual property was kind of stolen um, from these media conglomerates and profited off of. And so um, that's kind of two parts of the chapter. So I think to address this issue of like truth and memory, um, we need uh, certain things. And so, uh, again, I think not 
all of these will be called reparations per se, but they're like reparative efforts. And so, for instance, I mentioned um, the anti-CRT legislation earlier. Um, I think we need some of the opposite in some like blue states, like here in New York, that kind of mandate that you have to teach an anti-racist curriculum that accurately, you know, teaches the history of slavery, reconstruction, the failed project of reconstruction, uh, or the failed project of reconstruction, and doesn't just skip to the end of the civil rights era. You know, I didn't learn about Coental Pro um, until college. Um, and even then, when I learned about it, it sounded like a conspiracy theory to me, you know. I was asking myself, you know, how could the government infiltrate the Black Panthers and how could they see dissent and assassinate people? You know, that doesn't sound like America to me. You know, that was literally my thought process. So, um, you know, I think some would call that brainwashing, um, this idea of American, American exceptionalism, where me as a college, I think freshman or sophomore could learn about Coental Prawl and question it, even though it's a, you know, a real, it's a real thing, a, a, a history that happened. Um, so that's one way I think we obviously, um, we need to get rid of all of the monuments commemorating Confederate army officials um, and, and schools that commem commemorate them and bridges um, like General E. Lee and um, replace them with black movement figures. So, you know, not just Martin Luther King, but other leaders such as um, Queen Mother Audley Moore. She's kind of, um, I would say the, 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 uh, the, que the, the starter of the modern reparations movement. Mm -hmm. um, Audre, Audre Lorde, W.E. Du Bois, Searching the Truth, Harriet Tubman and others. And so I think we need to tear down those monuments and replace them with um, black movement figures. Hey, uh, hey, Trevor, when is um, that book coming out? The one with yeah. Darity? So it's going through edits now. It should go to probably like this time next year. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So Trevor, I wanna open it up now to the group. Diane, um, we have about 20 minutes, I think. And um, Trevor, thank you so, so much. Yes. It's a real, yeah. real pleasure. Um, <laughs> and I hope great. you're gonna continue to do work with us. Um, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, so. we, we hope you will, Trevor. I'm gonna be, we're gonna call on you right away. So thank you. And there have been some really good um, uh, topics and questions brought up in, the chat, and so now we're opening this up to uh, to to everybody. And uh, Alan uh, Gutman, if you can turn your uh, microphone on, because he uh, everybody we're going to encourage everybody to participate. But he he put some really good points in the, about reparations and about how um, how we we do these all the time, but. For some reason, the anti-blackness in white supremacy, and he also said we should talk white supremacy, or, and some other people said that. So, Alan, let me just ask you to uh, to talk about that. Yeah, and 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 thanks. And you know, first, I have been saying this for the last eighteen months. I hope all of you and your families are all well. Um, that's first things first. And just like Jordana said, you know, I've got to you know own also that. I've benefited from the white supremacy, you know, for my whole life and still working on my stuff. Um, but that said, I think, you know, people in this country have no problem always looking to Europe and saying, oh, that's a great thing they're doing. That's a great thing they're doing. But yet to apply it here, it seems like, well, no, that's not for us. So the models around um, reparations that have been provided to victims of the Holocaust, um, you know, and also, uh, the laws that they have, not just in Germany, but in France and some other countries, um, you know, the equivalent of like displaying a, you know, stars and bars flag, Confederate flag, battle flag on, on, a, on a law. And if you did that in Europe, if you displayed the Nazi flag, you're going to be arrested and either fined or put in jail. Um, so it seems like, you know, people might look at that and say, yeah, that's the right model over there, but have trouble applying it here. And you know, my last caveat coming at the end of what I just said is, I'm not an expert in this. You know, I just synthesize a lot of the great speaking that's happening today here um, with what I know and what I've experienced. So, okay, thank you, guys. You can come off mute, and you must have some feelings and thoughts about what Trevor has said. I have said, Farrell. Susie, has said. I can see Susie. Oh, Susie, great. go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to add to what Alan's been talking about, uh, Nazi reparations. 
that's very true. But in the UK, I'm a I'm a British person. I'm white. Um, we were, of course, directly involved in the Atlantic slave trade. I mean, we we were the architects of it. We were right in there at the beginning, and we were responsible for shipping, for stealing, and kidnapping uh, Black African people and and taking them to America. We are nowhere near having discussions about reparations. We are denying that we need to make reparations in this country. There is a movement to, you know, as I'm hearing you are talking about in the US, there's there's a movement in the UK to set up and create reparations. But our government uh, has only expressed regret on an official level for the Atlantic slave trade for its role, hasn't even apologized. We are really a long, long way from owning our role. And in this country at the moment, we are currently arguing about statues and, you know, that's that's where a lot of our, our discussion is right now. Um, we have a lot of work to do here. Um, most recently just finally there's a there's an, a, a conservative politician um i think his name's tony drax and he doesn't live far away from me and his ancestors were directly involved in the slave trade and he refuses to pay any reparations at all he's actually refusing to do that and just to finish at the when the british when my my country finished their um involvement in the slave trade we paid reparations to slave owners. So slave owners were paid money because they had lot, they suddenly didn't have access to all the free labor that they were getting. So the owners were compensated, but not, not the slaves. So this is just to give, so yes, in terms of like um, some forms of reparations, yes. But when it comes to the slave trade, we are not, we are so far away. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to bring that in. Um, yeah, no, it's important. There, there's, there's, there's this big wave of anti-blackness that overcomes people and, uh, and pushes back on anything about black people so, so we have to dive right into that anti-blackness. I, I think Daniel wants to say something. Yes, he does. <laughs> Take yourself off mute, my friend. Hey, everyone. No, I was just, um, as Alan was speaking, I was consuming um, what he said about Europe and um, these other places having the correct model. And I think oftentimes, I think as Americans, I think we get caught up in maybe sometimes people are like a step further than us or they their model looks differently than ours. So I think then we view it as um, it's the correct way. So when Alan, sorry to mention you, but when you um, mentioned France specifically, I'm a first generation Haitian American. So automatically I think about France's exploitation of Haiti. And then even as we're talking about American reparations in America, um, paying back those who were enslaved in America, I think about America's part in the exploitation of France of Haiti and America and other world powers telling Haitians, yes, you've technically gained your independence, but we will not trade with you until you pay back France this $21 billion um, for your freedom and things of that nature. So I think it's a really layered thing. So we'll see places, once again, specifically like France, say, you know what, we're giving back, we're repatriating all of um, our looted material from our museums, but I think it's still a super layered thing. So kind of right on one side, but rotten on the other. So I just thought it was interesting. But, I agree uh, completely but, with that. Daniel, that was... our, our, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, Alan, I, were you referring specifically to the model of Holocaust, the Jewish or the Nazi Holocaust reparations movement, right? Alan? Yeah, I, I, yeah, but I, I think Daniel's right in terms of, you know, I was kind of alluding to looking at outside and, you know, looking to models. And I think he's right, you know, because within, you know, a, a, piece of correctness if you look deeper down probably within a lot of the nations um you know i mean i think i think poland has gone the other way now where you can't even talk about the holocaust you know in in in, in schools anymore you, i mean it's like a, it's a denial society now so it's you know if i say europe obviously there's even exceptions within europe where it's the exact opposite 
Okay. Carol, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. you were going to say okay. something? Yeah, no, I was just saying I agree completely with what uh, Daniel and Susie were saying about the sort of European response in that. And in the regard to the triangle trade, though, specifically, because in that, it seems very uniform. You know, the UK, France, as was just mentioned, and I think like the most, in terms of numbers or benefit to it, like probably the European nations benefited most and engaged most severely with the triangle trade would be Portugal, maybe Spain, and neither is the exact same story. There's no difference. You know, the Belgian Congo thief, it's all very tied together. It's all very uniform in terms of response to the triangle trade in the European continent. And uh, it is interesting how in certain layers, certain things are addressed, like the return of artifacts from museums or specifically the response to the Nazi Holocaust. But uh, yes, not, not in this regard. Yeah. Uh, Sundiata? Peace. Uh, interesting Peace conversation. You. Big up to you, uh, Faro, and definitely Jordana, as usual, dropping all that serious information. But um, my thoughts were, uh, in when the... Uh, the Germans, I mean, when uh, when the Jews were paid reparations and the Japanese were paid reparations, there was a certain process that took place. And there was, you know, there was a case made, things were done, kind of, you know, somewhat like, I guess, what we're trying to do now. The difference, I think, in those, to, to me, uh, and everybody may not agree, is in the assessment of what is old and how because I hear a lot about, uh, you know, um, post-slavery and what was, what happened. If I, I've, as a storyteller, I will put it like this. If you were, if you owned a, if you, if, let's say you had a, a house and your whole family lived on your compound and an army came to your compound, killed you, you know, killed the family, took over, and then the children who were still alive who are still around, that's their compound. So if you set up business and you, uh, and then you enslave people and then you take insurance on them and then you do all these things that are, cons everything goes back to the land, you know, like Malcolm was saying. So I feel like a critical piece of history is missing in our assessment of reparations because if we talk about that thing you said about repair if we're going to go back to how things were in the beginning Europeans weren't here on the other hand some people say well Africans weren't here that's not true you know in millions of years ago according to certain books and you can check out Michael Cremo uh, with uh, ancient uh, with Britain archaeology a couple of other books too it is said that we were in this country long before the European or anyone else. So that means that, that's, that if there's any claim to the land, it's ours. So that means that the slavery, the atrocities and everything else that has happened is on top of that. And I would say, check out the Moroccan treaty. Uh, but anyway, so I just feel like if they have a purpose or a way of paying people, there's a few things that we need to look at in law that would prepare us to properly accept any form of payment that could be given us. Germans, I mean, uh, Jews, uh, they they have a nationality when they can talk about Israel, of course, post-1948. The Japanese have a land, so they have a nationality. So we are the only ones who are talking about a nation paying or people or aspects of a nation paying reparations to people who are technically on paper property chattel slaves if we do the if you do the law so i think we have to do some things to restat uh, give ourselves a different status to re uh, redefine our position in this country so that it, there would be a way for a nation to pay us because right now there's a nation has to pay a nation for reparations generally speaking there's I no think. nation that's being claimed mm -hmm. okay. I definitely think that that's interesting on the topic of nationality and the role that that plays in the discussion of reparations. I would say that 
that hasn't stopped the UK from not paying reparations to Jamaica or France to Haiti and all of those examples. So, so even if that were the case, because I that that makes sense. But even when that is the case, right, we still see that there are other roadblocks. You're right. So, you're right. So before we get to, we're anyway. going to run out of time. Well, there's okay. just Mark, Diane. There's just Mark. Also. Okay, but yeah. I want to oh. let let us just yeah. because we're going to go on. Okay. We want to make sure that people can can leave if they want to. Yes. So I, I want to uh, bring in Frank. Uh, so Frank, if you could unmute Frank. <laughs> and he will tell us about um, our plans going forward so that everybody knows uh, what else is on the agenda for the Racial Justice Collaborative. Okay. Peace, Brethren. How you doing? How's everybody? Uh, hope everybody enjoyed what we had so far. Um, and like I said, like everyone's saying, definitely make sure you stay on for the, the after party, as it's, as it's called now. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for coming, because I know everyone's busy. There's a trillion things to do, so I'm happy that everyone came out and spent this time with us. Um, we will be putting together a, a a thank you email for everyone that attended and I'll make sure that we have all these links. I see there's a ton of links in the, the chat. So I'll try and encapsulate all that so that you don't have to feel like you've got to do everything right this second. So we'll try and include the links and some reading material uh, for everyone that'll go out. The next event we have um, from Defense of Whiteness to Racial Resilience, and that is gonna be September 11th. It is in about three weeks, I think. So it is live on Eventbrite. And again, you will get, when the email goes out, the thank you email, it'll have a link for the upcoming event. So I hope you all uh, take a look at that. And if that interests you, join us for that one as well. And I thank you for coming. Thank you. And also, um, I don't think it's on Eventbrite yet, but we have, uh, we're, we're pulling all the work that we've done into a race retreat that we're thinking, we're calling a demand for reparations race retreat November 5th. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Now the September 11th event is uh, this uh, dip from defensive to resilient. Uh, we're, we're working and Lane is here. I'm looking right at him, <laughs> hi Lane. We're, we're working hard on creating a program, a process to help white people um, stay in the conversation, not the white people here, clearly, there's no problem, but there are a lot of white people that run away from the discussion of race or feel uncomfortable or, or just feel beaten down, however they feel. We're coming up with, a, with some processes. These are experiential opportunities for you to participate in the first rollout of these uh, experiential uh, helping white people become resilient, that's September 11th. And, uh, and we're going to continue that all next year. Because as we've said here, we've got to bring, white people are part of the human family. And they're a big part of the United States. And we're going to bring white people into the discussion where they're not going to be left out. So uh, having said that, let's go back now. So, so it's noon. Anybody who has to leave. Yeah. Uh, we're happy, as, as I usually say, if you have to leave, you can go ahead, but we hope you stay. I see the Race Recovery Project is here, still here. They brought up in the chat uh, the importance of, so if you could take your uh, mic off mute. Hey, Diane. Yes. Diane, I just want to thank Trevor Smith again for okay. being here in case he has to leave. Um, really appreciate your input. It was fantastic. That's, so thank you. Sorry, Diane, go ahead. Yeah, so what? Uh, Thank you all problem. for having me. I do have to jump at 12, but it was a pleasure to be with you. And yeah, obviously, hopefully I see you all um, in some capacity again. Yes. Thank you. Bye, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Thank Peace. You. So what, uh, what the Race Recovery Project raised in the chat was, uh, the, the, it didn't raise it quite this way, but it's it's the difference in looking at the, through the prism of white supremacy, as opposed to thinking we're talking about racism. So if, um, if, if race recovery is still there and wants to raise that. 
Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Diane and the Racial Justice Coalition. This is a great movement. I'm so happy to be able to join this discussion. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, as the founder director of the Race Recovery Project, whose focus is around the decolonization of Blackness unapologetically, it really does become something that becomes inherently um, ingested into the being, this idea of white supremacy. And to focus then on racism really loses the ability potentially and the opportunity to shift back to a place where we're really repairing the dispowering and um, the dysfunction in the structure of power that exists in white supremacy. Racism really points us towards the victimization and white supremacy helps us look at the terrorization. And so I'd love to be able to kind of, to, that is the work of the Race Recovery Project to, re, to really restore, reclaim, recover blackness to a place where that infiltration by the dysfunction of, of white supremacy um, it allow, is separate and allows them to move forward um, healthily. So this was a great discussion, but yes, wanted to drop that in. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Um, I just, Diane, I wanted to make a point um, to race recovery. I'm sorry, I don't see your name there. Um, it sounds like you're, uh, it sounds like you're agreeing with uh, Professor Darity in the sense that he wants to shift this to the perpetrators and the beneficiaries of white supremacy and away from the, the, the idea of victimization. So I, I don't know if you agree with that or if you I agree. Professor I, I agree okay. with that. I think what ends up happening is, and I think that's been the case since the civil rights movement, that the idea of the focus being on those individuals who have been subject to victimization through transatlantic enslavement and enslavement as a result are, is where we need to repair. The repair needs to be to occur in the white supremacist structures that allowed for that kind of um, transactions to occur, the, mm -hmm. the disenfranchisement to occur in the first place. If we start there, the repair to the victims will come inherently. Yeah, thank you. Hey, and, Mark. Uh, and, and Mark was- Mark uh, had a comment. On, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat lost in thought, but um, I really um, you know, appreciated uh, Trevor's presentation and share um, specifically the conversation around narrative, right? And so, um, and, and language used in narrative and how do we use that and how do we think about it? I don't have an answer, of course, but how do we think about it um, um, as a way of getting to where we wanna go? And so, so I'm kind of curious as we talked about reparations versus um, I use the word atonement, um, sort of getting at the immorality of it and um, and whether or not that moves the needle strategically to talk about the morality of, of, of the situation that we're talking about, um, particularly moving for uh, people of white race identity. And so I'm sort of curious the question around strategy um, and narrative shift and for people who are storytellers, uh, Satyata. Um, and others is really thinking about the story that we're telling around this so that we can talk about it. And I don't know if it moves the needle for white folks to talk about white supremacy. I, I feel like that becomes even more of a shutdown when you mention white supremacy as a term, um, it feels overwhelming to them. Um, and it, it, are we talking about different audiences when we're using terminology? Um, and as we're sort of weaving stories and, and creating a different narrative, an alternative narrative to, to existing narratives that are there. I, I, I have, have a, a thought concerning that. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm now in, in Mississippi where, of course, a, a lot went on and it continues to go, go on. And um, I, I, I think, think that the, the culture of, of a place and of, of groups of people play a, a big part 
and in uh, in uh, the the thought process and how how decisions are made and how the state is uh, governed uh, on, on a weekly basis uh, we have um, presentations um, that deal with different issues around um, uh, civil rights issues and, and and what's happening in the past and I I think that uh, if that that audience have uh, lots of, of white people there, um, but, uh, but we the, the 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 narrative is very important important because uh, uh, many times is the 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 white supremacist attitude is presented in a pejorative way. And there was a time when I made the, the comment that uh, we should recognize that not all white people thought that way. And in fact, there were many who, who, who were very helpful in, in the whole process of uh, 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 help helping the the enslaved pe people, um, and, and and just one point considering reparations. Uh, since, since I've been back here, I've I, I've surprisingly found out that that there were some people who who did receive the 48, quote, 40 acres and a mule. And, and in some cases, some have done very well. And in other cases, they, they um, ignorantly sold off the land because they, they did, did not know what to do do with it, and, and so many of them were were getting away from the fields. So that uh, it, it's it's a very complicated issue. I, I do not agree with the the, the simple uh, giving out a certain amount of money to to people because there are, there are lots of people who are financially illiterate and would not would not know what what to do with it in a productive way. Um, but I do think that maybe there, there could be some model that would help uh, educate people and help them improve their their lives and um, opportunities to enrich themselves and for for a past gener for for future generations. That's going to be the beauty of um, the, the whole big discussion that goes on before we even get to reparations. There are a lot of perspectives and, and all of those will be weighed at this. What we're trying to do is enable people to engage in the discussion, whatever their perspective. I, I just want to uh, highlight what you said, Mark. Uh, I, I think that uh, feels really important that I think a lot of white people really do get defensive and fragile and, and freak out when they hear terms like white supremacy. That's not me. I'm not a Klan member, right? And, and so I, I feel that how... how 
the narrative is is really important as you said um and the language that we use and at the same time uh like how can we also and how how can we like-minded white people uh you know actually train up other white people to to be more resilient uh so that they can hear things like that um i think both sides are important uh how we frame it and also how we help white people not be so racially defensive and uh so that that's what the thing is going to be in two weeks that's what we're going to be working on there um so i just wanted to mention that can i ask you a question lane sure uh, you and uh jordana and some of our other members here are very knowledgeable and when i hear you talk i have a lot of hope that america will make it because there are people who are awake um but my question is from your perspective, why do you feel like it's, do you think it's a lack of, of true history or it's a lack of, um, what is it that keeps the conservative European, I try to say European and not white and black because I'm getting out of that, but keeps the U European American away from being able to accept the, the conservative ones, um, to being able to accept that other people have a right to live, first of all, uh, <laughs> Black Lives Matter, that's the example, um, too, and I have the right to thrive, uh, like Tulsa, you know what I mean? Like, why is it, what is it inside, do you think, that makes a person or makes a group of people feel like it's okay to do that? Is it from a per historic perspective, because maybe we did something to, maybe the, maybe the Moors did something to the Europeans? Or, you know, where does it come from? Because if there's not that knowledge there, where, what is it? I don't get it. <laughs> I think that's a really deep question, Sundiata. And, and, and uh, I think that part of it, that's right, is a lack of historical knowledge, like this, this stuff that we learned today from Jordana and, and, and Trevor, just, and, and, and Pharaoh. And uh, so I, 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 I think that, most most of us don't know that most white folks don't know that stuff uh i learned so much today i learn so much every time i come to these events um and then there's also all the racial socialization that we all get uh that that you know sees white people lifted up and black people put down you know and and sees black people as dangerous and sees black people as, you know, lazy, the same sh stuff that we were, you know, talking about, uh, hear hearing about today. And, and, um, and so people have that white people have that in their heads. And even, even if, you know, progressive people, you know, it's not just the conservatives, even progressive people who, you know, think the right things, uh but we all still have those biases inside of us and so i may be thinking the right thing but then have that knee-jerk reaction um and so that much more for people who aren't even thinking in the right direction uh so that's another one and then there's um there's a there's a kind of trauma that uh that uh Whew. Sorry, I get I get I get so moved by this stuff. There's a kind of trauma that Resma Menikum talks about in his incredible book, My Grandmother's Hands, about racialized trauma. Uh, and and that trauma is oh. called moral injury. And moral injury is the trauma that happens when we perpetrate harm on somebody else or when we witness that harm. Uh, and or even hear about that harm that we feel a moral injury so i think that white people have a lot of trauma from from what we have done 
and then hearing about what we have done. And so even if we hear a word like white supremacy, like, whoa, 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 right? Or we hear about Black Lives Matter. It's like, I don't want to hear. It's like traumatic to me to hear that black people are getting killed by white people. So I don't even want to hear about that. I, all my fight, flight, freeze uh, jumps up. So I think it's a combination of a lot of different things. And Thank you for your honesty. Jordana, did you answer that same question? Would you mind? Uh, I, um, that's a, a very, so the people who know me here know that I, uh, Trevor talked about preaching to the choir when he's talking right. about, well, when we're talking about white people, I don't believe there is a choir. I, I think even the most progressive, at least American white people, the ones that I know, there's still, there's still a block there. And Lane and I have talked about this. We don't totally agree, but I, I just think there's a lot of work. And when Miss Annie was saying, you know, that during slavery, there were white people who helped. Yeah, there have always been white people who've helped, but not enough of them as individuals. And also when you talk about a system, it doesn't matter how many individual whites are helping in whatever help that is when you've got a system laden with right. not non-helpers and silent witnesses who are just mm. you know raising their hands and saying this is terrible but literally don't do anything and don't say anything and most importantly don't go and learn what's out there and and no matter what the 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 trauma to white people is of what happened it's like get over it learn what you need to learn and when you learn that's what gives you the power to to, to do things or, or, you know, whatever it is you can do, because without it, you're just sitting in ignorance and, and feeling like, well, it doesn't involve me. And to be honest, I'll say something else. There's something in, in US culture overall, and I'll say white culture, there's an ingrained, this individualism and a selfishness that I care about me and my family and my children, and I don't care about other people and I can't worry about other people. And part of that, I think, is all of the problems are so overwhelming, climate, you know, white supremacy, that people don't even know how to, how, where to grab it first. And I think that's what we, a group like this, is trying to do, or, or Trevor's, you know, reparative narrative lab, like that's going to help people grab this problem, hopefully. So I, I'm a, a glass half full kind of gal. If, if I can, if I can, if I can add to your half, half glass. empty. Sorry, glass half. Oh yeah, yeah. If I can add to your <laughs> emptiness of your glass. Yes, thank you. Uh, it, <laughs> you see, one of the important things I, over this couple of years working with Farrell, and especially because of his interest in this, you know, not just the current uh, unfolding of history, but the how the past has has impacted. It is. You can't find a place in United States history, even before the Constitution, where we weren't fully anti-Black. And, and, and we used to say it more directly. So we are an anti, it's not just, it's not just even just slavery, it's anti-Black. We, we don't even believe that, or haven't historically believed that Black people even belong to the full human family. And that mm -hmm. hasn't changed. So because we haven't, and, and you can look at any part in time, the beginning of the Constitution, the Dred Scott case, the separate but equal, the black codes, the, uh, uh, and, and I've worked with the recovery project. They, they look at all these things. And, and, if, and if you look at uh, all the things that have been pushed into us, it's part of our DNA to be anti-black. It's so strong that everybody, as we talked, Farrell and I talked about it recently, it's not Americans, I mean, Black people in the United States, African Americans, are the biggest Americans that there are because we only have, in our awareness, we only have America. We're not coming from Greece or Italy or, or holding on to some kind of ritual. We're here in, in the United States of America. And what do we also have? Anti-Blackness people of color, immigrants, what do you have? You have 
the belief in anti-blackness, that's what makes you white. That's how you join into the white people. They have all the goodies. You want to join in, you be anti-black. Even black people, we have it. So that's why we haven't been able to, uh, that's your answer, Sundiata, from me. We haven't overcome it because we haven't even tried. And because it's in all, if, if we black people didn't have it so much, white supremacy couldn't thrive so big. So it's a big effort. That's right. And, and a, right. Further, a, fur, a furtherance to that point That's right. um, uh, is, is not an informational gap here. Um, it's not going to be overcome by information. It is an attitudinal right. issue. And that is why it's so entrenched. It's been there for centuries. Um, it is an immense amount of psychological, emotional work that needs to happen in order to get people, Black people and others and whites um, to overcome that, um, to look that in the face. Uh, information alone won't do it. Um, it's, again, that's not the issue, um, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my experience. Um, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. Certainly, that it's uh, it, it's so entrenched in that way because there's so much like layers piled on top of this through history, through you know advancements in sociology, you're always developing new terms for historical aspects or you know the psychological aspects of things. But it all is adding to a pre-existing thing, which, in my opinion, is just basic human, call it primitive tribalism in a desire to be looking out for yours and have a very hyper defensive view and uh, willingness to exploit those that are outside of whatever you define as your circle. And that's changed over time, but certainly for a very long time that has been defined by the modern concept of race. And that's, I think, why this is so entrenched and it's not necessarily going to be dissuaded by education, or at least not for most people. I, I agree with that. I think that that is certainly enough to persuade some people, but not most that won't, you know, rid the world of the issue. Yeah, I agree. Knowledge is important. And I think for some people, it would help them to process and move forward. For some people, like you said, it's attitude is deeply embedded in a, in something that's kind of old, like my mother told me, you know, that we were born into something that had been ingrained for so long that by the time we got here to try to erase it in a few years is, is kind of unrealistic. You have to kind of look at it for what it is. So I agree with you, Mark, as far as, yeah, some people, it, it, you could tell them all day it ain't going to happen. But I do believe that there are some people, like some of the people on this call, that knowledge has definitely changed how they would perceive this country and what's going on compared to someone else. Knowledge is power. Well, I, I agree that knowledge is power. And I, I also agree with Dr. King that this is a moral issue. And I think, yes. uh, unfortunately, uh, we haven't driven the immorality of racism and white supremacy. And people haven't felt that in their core enough. And I think that's where some change starts to happen. Where people who really, I mean, this is why people don't like, even racists don't like to be called racist because it's sort of, it's injurious to their id. It's injurious to their own sense of self um, and some basis of morality that they want to hold on to. Um, and we have, I think it's necessary to talk about this as a moral issue as well. Um, and I think we start changing people in their souls that might open up to the actual information. So, you know, I think this sort of denial of self is sort of shuts down the ability to receive information that could be helpful in that. I think um, that and that needs to open up a bit. But, but pe people do, do not know what they don't know. And, 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 and uh, too many cases, uh, uh, many people also do, do not understand that they have the ability to change things. You're born, you grow up in a system 
and you learn that things should be done in a certain way. And that lifestyle is related to, to, to your, your cultural uh, te teachings, uh, uh, um, generally pertaining to, to that family community and what, whatever area you live in. The, the, the uh, social media uh, uh, has a <clears throat> limited lens that, that focuses on uh, basically the, the, the big, 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 big cities or, or selective groups. So there are many people who, who are not a, a, able to think outside of the box. And even if, if you g give them the, the certain knowledge, they're, they're not, not able to pro process it. In, in the way that you expect or the way that you, you would like them to 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 process it so that that that's why uh changing a, a, a societal mentality takes a long time i think part of the sort of uh, response, because it had been mentioned that a lot of time uh, racists will have a negative response to being called a racist. I think that there could be aspects of an uh, internal moral dilemma about that, but I also think that a large part of that response just comes from racism and bigotry being stylized as negative now in the media. And that has been the case for not very long from a historical standpoint, but by an individual human's lifespan, decently long-ish you know, enough decades. And in that sense, I think that it's not necessarily about any issue of morality in the heart or how someone identifies with their beliefs, but just staying outside of a surface level societal area of indictment by being blatantly seen as a racist, which is why it's such a common game, especially in politics now, and has been, so I guess reason, I shouldn't say now, to, you know, just incredibly strongly imply blatantly racist things through euphemism, uh, through euphemism and just continually skirt around those lines while still making uh, bigoted points or position clear and evident. I, I want to bring up, uh, the, there are some people that are looking like they have some things they want to say. I want to point them out so that they can say those things. Race Recovery Project, I see your face. So I want you to introduce yourself. Uh, Dizena, you got something to say. Paula, uh, Jai, Dawn, uh, all these women. Let's go ahead. Well, I'll introduce myself again now with my video on. Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I am Senya Bembe, uh, the Race Recovery Project. What I wanted to say, though, is that as we're talking about where this begins, one of the things that has become clear to me as a psychiatrist, someone who has done psychoanalysis and have been in clinical practice for over two decades, what is clear to me is that there's a, there's a, a level of fear around uh, displacement. And what I mean by that is that we are born into this world with, with what appears to be endless resources. As we begin to grow and develop and mature and socialize, as Lena said, we become much more informed about the limited resources or at least the limit to you of those resources. And I, white or black, we are all at this precarious place where we, 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 weary, we, wear, we worry about how we are to access the resources we need, who will provide those resources that we should have, and then what happens if we lose those resources we need. And I think there are those in power who pos position themselves in power to maintain that the, the, the resources, and even they are afraid of potentially losing the power of access to resources. But those of us who potentially are less empowered, those of us who have historically been 
less available to access to those resources, certainly live out our lives with this tax around fearfulness about being 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 able to access resources. And that's what I think lies at the heart, at least to, to some degree lies at the heart of why we are unable to talk about white supremacy as white supremacy. It is because at the heart of it is this idea that we are all clamoring for resources. We are all clamoring to try to amass, attain, maintain a sense of stability, security, and well-being. And if that is precariously limited to a few, then we all are sort of attempting to try to marginalize or marshal um, some mechanisms by which we get that, we get the resources we need, or we get in touch with those people who have the resources that we think we need. Why that thus white supremacy persists amongst blacks and amongst whites. I agree with that completely. I, I feel that's very core to what I was saying before about this being tribalism is fighting to protect resources in a world with scarce resources and maybe scarce isn't the right word like you just described it's about even if it feels like it's plentiful it's not going to be available to everyone and that's what that is at its core is protecting things or what you feel like is protecting things from others that might try to take a limited number from your perceived group guys in the jump right in paula go ahead Sure. Thank you, Diane, for calling me out. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, which is actually what I want to speak to is um, this space and what, what everyone here is doing, because um, I actually just um, had the thought that I feel very new to the conversation that we're having, um, but there's something in my soul that feels old um, in knowing that my voice needs to be heard. Um, I'm used to working individually, one-on-one -on -one with people in counseling and coaching and mentoring um, and working on the healing processes and all those things. And this space makes me so nervous and excited and scared, crapless, I shouldn't swear, swear um, because it's, it's a conversation that's so much bigger than me. Um, and bigger than us. And it's a conversation that takes such bravery and courage to have. And so my comment is that I just acknowledge each and every one of you for doing this work because I've been in two of these spaces and each time I come out and I'm just, I, just, I literally keep my feet on the ground and I keep breathing because um, it is that important. Um, it's that old it doesn't it's nothing that my mind holds just yet like everyone here is so articulate you've been studying you've got all of this information i don't have that all i have is the soul that's like honey yes it's you so you figure out your people you get it together and you do what you're brought here to do um so i just want to say thank you because i've never and i've been in some places i've been in some spaces that have been powerful but this space is just um moving me at my core and so i just want to thank each and every one of you for for bringing me to this next level which is um i guess this is what 50 does huh <laughs> <laughs> that's what i have to say thank you that's well, what 50 does you can imagine what it's like to be 68 <laughs> and i'm one of those people that i'm really a novice in this area and i retired about two years ago and I realized that I put so much into working and working and physically working and trying to attain something. And then all of a sudden you stop for a minute and you think about it, that a lot of the critical race theory, a lot of my blackness, I didn't take the time to enjoy it, to investigate it, to learn about it. So I'm taking this time now doing book clubs, different associations, whatever I can get to try to really prepare myself more so for doing quote the work. So this has been like fantastic for me. It's given me a lot of new insights, all of the comments that people have, and I'm gonna continue on and see what things I can do to develop myself, but actually come closer to actually doing some work with this. So I thank you all. Go ahead, Jai. 
Hello, thanks for um, calling on me, Diane. I, I don't have anything brilliant or exciting to say, but I'm really happy to be here with everyone. And um, it's um, touching to me to learn from you all. And thank you, Jordana, for your amazing, and Pharaoh and Trevor and everyone that has spoken for your input. I learn so much every time I come. Uh, one of the things I think that uh, holds people back, white people, um, I just wanted to say is a sense of shame that uh, it's, it's a moral issue and how could we have let this happen and how could we continue? So I think that sense of shame, also I just wanna name it, can be paralyzing. And we're hoping uh, uh, to help people with that uh, when we um, uh, work with uh, white folks in a couple of weeks on the um, how to develop resilience uh, in those difficult and racial conversations. So um, I'm looking forward to that and wanting to help in every way I can. And um, I personally um, am passionate about dismantling white supremacy. And so um, doing what I can, happy to be here and thank you to everyone. Thank you, Jai. Larry, uh, oh. if you could unmute and talk, we'll hear from you today for sure. Well, one of the things I wanted to uh, remind everybody is that today, I believe it's the 50th, 8th anniversary of Dr. King's uh, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And it's also a big demonstration going on right now about voting rights and the loss of voting rights. So, you know, we're talking here a combination of both personal work that needs to be done and how we can help people do personal work and how we can do personal work on ourselves. But there's also the larger power question, um, which is moving away from us. I mean, several people have made reference to what's happening in curriculum in schools where, where we're trying to teach this. And, and they're literally state legislatures a, 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 that, are, that are, are, are passing laws and criminalizing this teaching, never mind what's happening with voter rights um, in a whole bunch of states that, that this rally um, is trying to push the Senate to get 10 votes or get around the filibuster. I'm just trying to say there's a larger issue going on here about power, political power and, and, and voting and, and what's being taken away from us in the work that we're trying to do. Agreed. Not to take anything away from the personal work we're here trying to work on and help others work on. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I just want to point out, and I'm going to call Jordana back to uh, pull us all uh, to the end of this. Uh, it, it feels like the energy is we're about finished with everything we want to say, unless somebody else has uh, something you can just jump right in. I want to point out that what I hear and what I see, we've got this system called capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so that is a big, that you have to subsum everything anti-blackness, it's all about money, as they say in the land of milk and honey. It's all about money and, it's, and that money is about capitalism. Capitalism uh, promotes competition and individualism is promoted in the United States. So there's, there are bigger issues. If we're really serious about change, we've got to look at our economic systems. I think that that definitely plays a really big role. I think that that is because the uh, control of wealth in that way and the way that we have set up in the capitalist system is, you know, private ownership of wealth obviously is the main vehicle for individual power or even political power on a larger scale. But I think that you can still trace it to it being about uh, influence. Money just happens to be our culture and our economic system and the West way of influence. Uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up just because I saw it uh, in the chat a while ago and it's of my particular field of interest was uh, Mark had mentioned about the deflection tactic of 
bringing up aspects of, uh, of African kingdoms selling uh, uh, slaves to European markets and how that's often used as a deflection tactic in discussions right. about the triangle trade. And I, I definitely agree with that, but a point that he made specifically, which wasn't something that I usually thought of in the context, was how the, perhaps all, but I would say at least the majority of the onus for that act falls on the buyer rather than the seller, particular be, uh, particularly because that creates the, uh, the cause and uh, the demand for the market in the first place, especially in the context, and that's true for slavery in general, like throughout the entire history of it, but especially in the context of the triangle trade and in Africa, because that was the only way that these kingdoms could get modern weapons that were manufactured in Europe. And so if anyone did them, if anyone did that business, they would get a massive military advantage over their neighbors. And then that would pressure all the others to do the same or they would be conquered easily by their rivals. And so it caused this chain reaction throughout West Africa where they had to engage in this or they would be potentially conquered by a rival African nation that now had European weapons or be directly conquered by a European power that also had uh, obviously European weapons. So it, it was a added level to the cycle. I feel like in the discussion about the triangle trade, that's the part that's usually least discussed comparatively to the role that the Americas played in production of raw goods and Europe played in manufacturing. It's usually the politics of, of Africa that usually get left out in that whole discussion. Uh, Farrell, I have a question for you regarding that. And I don't know if you know the answer or if someone else does. So my reading was initially when Africans were selling to the to the market, they were presuming that it was a, a type of bondage similar to the bondage they were they were used to, which was not chattel slavery. And they also didn't really know what was going to happen eventually to the people. And that when they did really find out, they they stopped that sale or they tried to stop it and they, they weren't involved in the same way. I was wondering if that's true or if there's anything. anything that, yeah, there. no, that's, that, that is true because the both like, uh, you know, West African polytheists, there's a bunch of different religions that take too long to name them all, you know, like Yoruba or show whatever. But um, that perception of slavery as well as the Muslim perception of slavery was very different from the triangle trade perception, the thing that they have in common, which is why they are called the same name, is that individuals are owned by someone. But even besides that, you know, in the African polytheistic concepts and even in the Muslim concepts, oftentimes slaves were paid. Slaves could be in high ranks of government. Slaves were frequently in high ranks of military, often using elite military, like not to go on a long tangent about it, but there is a all West African military guard in Morocco that, and the reason why they use slaves for that is because they're, they wouldn't have tribal affiliations that Arabs or Berbers might have for the po political situation in like Muslim kingdoms. Anyway, the point is that it was very different, like you're saying. It wasn't the, you know, no, uh, oftentimes the, you know, in Barbary or Arab slave trades, they have slaves, certain slaves wouldn't be paid, but it was much more varied as opposed to the much more monolithic, you know, race, uh, permanent caste, uh, you know, inflexible and perpetually like the lowest tier of society that the role of slavery played in the, you know, the colonies of the, of the Western powers. And you are also right that that wasn't really known until some time later. And then there was expressed sentiment by some kingdoms to uh, cease operations in the slave trade but then they got to the point where i said where the ones that didn't then had a massive advantage over the ones that did and then they were threatened by their power and oftentimes through that they were you know bullied into eventually resuming uh slave trade in that regard i Madonna, there's I, an interesting book can I, i'm sorry i was saying oh, no, there I'm was so an sorry. interesting book you might want to uh, saying there was an interesting book that you might want to look at it it's called uh the procure 
in its stamp. So, if Sundiata, I can you say correctly. it again? Because you cut out. At least I didn't hear it. Oh, it's called the Peculiar Institution. I think it's by Kenneth Stamp. I, I read it. Well, I, you know, I studied it in the eighties. But anyway, it was just kind of documenting the differences between the institution that was practiced here and that which was practiced in other places. You know, there was a different and difference, like Farrell was talking about, as far as you know, the term to use slavery or American slavery. And then other terms of indentured servitude or, 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 you know, domination by another nation is how I kind of look at it. Right. But that's a good, uh, something you might want to look at. Also, Thank you. I will. Thank Dr. You. Ivan Van Sertimus, they came before Columbus. He kind of talks about some of it. Hi, um, this is Karen speaking under Greg. I'm sorry, um, Sandiata, were you finished speaking? Before yes, I, I was. Greg wants to speak as well. Wonderful. Okay, so I know I come up as Greg, but I'm really Karen. <laughs> oh, okay. I was confused. I'm like, woman. <laughs> Sorry, Rick go Anna. ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. So I just wanted to touch on, I believe um, earlier I heard someone say that um, giving financial um, reparations um, to people, they um, disapprove of that and because they thought that somehow or another, not all persons were gonna be responsible. And I say to that, um, if there's a small percentage of those who are not responsible, that's their issue. We're mm -hmm. looking at the larger picture. Um, and while you can create programs like housing and you know, uh, programs for children and, you know, and the elderly, you, we need um, financial reparation too. I think that is huge. And how someone um, deems it appropriate to utilize um, those funds um, given. And I believe it was Trevor who said around 254,000, I could be off by, you know, a couple thousand, but I think it's very important to have the financial um, reparation in addition to all of their programs set up. And I also feel that, uh, persons that were um, direct descendants of slavery should have free health care. Um, you can have all the money in the world, all the programs in the world, but if your health is poor or you're receiving poor health care, you're, you, you know, you might as well just be dead. And because none of, none of, none of the other programs, money can help if you can't um, live a healthy life. That's my two cents. Sorry. <laughs> Are we still here? <laughs> You're muted, Jordana, or you don't know. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, Karen, I, I think people are taking in what you just said. And I, I so agree with you, which was also Trevor's point that it's up to people to decide what they want to do with, with the method or how they're repaired. And they rise or fall, just like everyone else. They have a right to, to rise or fall, uh, you know, well, that's it, yeah. I, I agree with Jordana. Uh, we're, we're talking, we're not trying to guarantee that everybody's got you know, and maintains a ton of anything. We're, we're talking about being treated in the United States the same way other people have been treated. And if you look at other people, it's like what Jordana brought up in her, uh, in her presentation, some of the white people who greatly benefited from slavery maintained their wealth and still have wealth. Some of them lost it. And so that's just equity. Everybody had, they had a chance and, they, and, and that's our right. We do as we please with what we have. So give, we're looking, not give, this is a debt. That's another thing, <laughs> this is a debt that, that, that uh, must be paid to the uh, American descendants of the enslaved. And, and what we do with it is up to us. Just like everybody's wealth has always been up to them. Exactly. Agreed. I think uh, the person who was talking about uh, the education behind what to do with the money, I don't, I didn't get out out of that comment. They were saying we shouldn't get money. I think it was saying that that's not enough because there are some people who would take 
you know, take a monetary payment and say, okay, we straight. And, you know, without proper education and this, and I mean, yeah, what we do with our money is our money, but I just think looking forward, yes, we should have a plan in place so that when we, when this thing happens, that we don't squander the funds, that we don't, you know, go spend them on Jordans and, and you know, <laughs> new cars and stuff instead of investing in our future. So I'm not trying to defend anybody, but I didn't get that <laughs> in that comment. I, I I agree. It's all. It's not just uh, it's not just money. There are other things as well. Education is big. Jordan, do you want to that 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 comment what was mine and it exactly related to to the um. To, 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 to the idea that just giving people, people money what was not enough because after it, it, it is like when people win the lottery, some, some of those people after a, a certain time, they're, they're still right back where they started. So, so uh, just like you said, you have to do more than, than just hand, hand out dollars. We can see that that just doing the, the, the stimulus payments. So, so, so some people have done okay with it. And others have not. And a lot, a lot depends on where, where, where you start from, how, how, how educated you are about, about, about finances, and how you use what you get. A miseducated school in their state is quickly broke. And um, attached to the financial reparation, there should definitely be a class attached to that reparation um, that teaches you how to um, plan and you know and you know invest that money so that it just doesn't fly out the door. Exactly. Daniel, you had your hand up. Yeah. Hey everybody. Um, I've been texting Asia throughout this, so she encouraged me to share my thoughts. <laughs> um, hey. I think, so I hear what everyone's saying, um, but part of me feels like, I don't know, I feel like we're losing the plot in like some of these ways when speaking about this idea of financial reparations, because I think we're speaking about it as if it's like a, a, a gift almost in a sense, but it's like a, a repayment of sorts. So like, I, I personally wouldn't care what a person spent their repayment on. That's kind of their business and not mine. So I understand what we're saying. I think what we're saying is more so kind of the idea of like social reform. And we're looking for um, like these classes to like um, financial freedom and like um, learning to invest and things of that nature. But I don't, I don't think that is the same conversation as reparations. I think those are kind of like two different, yeah. very different things. So I just... If we're talking about reparations, I think people should be, uh, the labor has already been done. So once again, it's not like a, a gift or a grant or anything of that nature. It is quite like literally a repayment. So I think- yeah, It's a debt, what it's a debt. Choices, what you do with yours. It's, a, yeah, it's like yeah. Diane said, it's a debt. Alan, you have your hand up? Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also of a mind that the reparations is just a small piece of it because if still the society that black people are going to be using that reparations in is still a society where the dollar is not valued or the dollar can't be used or you can't use it in a place where you'd like to use it, then there's still these other issues. And that doesn't mean we stop on the reparations front but I think it means it has to be linked to the systemic. And I've also heard pushback on always looking at the systemic, but I like to address that by saying, 
the systems are not without people. There's people functioning in the systems and that's how the systems function. So when I say systemic, it means addressing the people that are in the systems and perpetuating the systems, you know, that either create or sustain or maintain privilege and that, you know, unprivileged and disadvantage others. Um, I'll stop there. I couldn't agree more, Alan. Um, I, I was thinking the same thing before you said that. And, it, you know, reparations, I think, is definitely debt owed and it has to be sort of paid forward. But the problem is, is that if we take that money and put it in the system that exists currently, we will have what we had before because the system that exists currently was built off of anti-Blackness, colonization, white supremacy. And if we do not dismantle the system or repair that system, reparations will just go into a system that continues to persist in the same dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And going to what Diane was saying earlier, we got to look at the economic system itself because my uh, late teacher, Munavana, taught me back in the 88, he said, if you were to erase all of any, any form of people on the planet who you thought were the problem, the problem would still be there as long as the system is there. It would just be with other people. The people who look like you would be doing the same things. This, see, the, it, this all brings up in my mind something that Jordana we, we talk about this back and forth all the time, even like a word like reparations, repair, that is that there, or reconciliation. That there's some implication in there that it used to be good and now we're gonna fix it back. It never was good. So we have to, we have to tear <laughs> this thing down or however you wanna look at it. I can fix it, I make my language different, but you, you cut it up, and you sort it out and you start over. And so that, and so we, there's a lot of work that has to go in and repair nothing because it wasn't ever good. Good point. Amen. <laughs> yeah, thank you for saying that, Diane. I, I, this is Greg speaking as Greg. Um, <laughs> I, I think one of the things that people kind of lose sight too of is that the system was built to keep certain people back. And, you know, reparations are a step in the right direction, but breaking down how we exist within the system has to be addressed as well. And that's the bigger, bigger um, elephant in the room that it's going to be hard to tackle because it's been instituted for, you know, centuries, right? So uh, we really need to have a critical eye into how these systems that we're relying on to help us go forward with an idea like reparations, actually uh, implement something like that if it does happen. Even having a discussion about it at the federal level is an issue, right? Because everyone has a stake, a, a certain opinion about what should or shouldn't happen. Yes, Greg, thank you. And that, and, that, and so remember September 11th, at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, because that's what we're doing. We're, we're finding a way to bring, help white people find a voice and, and, and calm their body enough so they can begin to even be here and hear what we're saying without shutting their ears. That's gotta be the first step. There's a lot of, a lot of work that we're all ready to do, but we've got a lot of people and, and so we're, we're, that's, that's where we're putting our effort. That's our big effort, helping people come to the table. Acceptance, this is Greg speaking as Karen. Um, <laughs> acceptance, <laughs> acceptance is the first step. Um, yes. we're, no one's trying to blame anyone at this point. What we need you to do is accept the responsibility, you know, for your ancestors and then listen to what those who were gravely affected have to say about the topic um, of racism and white supremacy and how uh, we are still affected, um, you know, dramatically by things that people are saying, oh, that happened so long ago. Well, if you're still a part of what happened a long, long ago, 
um, you know, where do we move forward? We need to move forward where everybody's at the table, listening and not being offended by the subject matter. Right. Right. That's a big step. Big step. Huge. But they can do it. I have full Point. confidence. Yep. Sorry, I just forgot. I, was I, I agree completely. And like a big part of this that was, it was mentioned earlier, I believe, by uh, Giordano when you had mentioned about uh, a particular aspect of American society, even more than, you know, talking about any sort of overarching, you know, aspects of race between nations. But a particular thing with American society is how an American white culture which then, you know, gets relayed to every other American. The focus of primary importance is on the self and on very small units rather than on larger, you know, interconnected principles. So that makes it harder, I believe, on an individual level, both to care about those on the outside and to worry about those outside of that already small group. <laughs> But in addition to that, there's also a very strong sense that individuals are assumed to have control over the things around them. And that even if that's not, even if that's blatantly untrue, that's just sort of a general cultural perception. And so that's why American culture puts lots of blame of negative circumstances on individuals in those circumstances. Beryl, could you break that down a little? What do you mean? What? What do you mean? What I mean is all of the, these, there's just a lot of facets of American culture that makes pushing for things like this and convincing people of things like this even more difficult than in other cultures. And so because of that, the added layer of having to tweak everything that you say in order to convince people that they should care or lend any support to the things that we're saying here is even more difficult than in other situations. Right. Lane, do you want to weigh in? I, I see you ready. Uh, I, I actually need to go for because of family stuff. Unfortunately, I'm so appreciating what everybody's saying and learning from every one of you and and uh, yeah, deeply grateful for today. Thank you, Jordana and yeah, Trevor and everybody who shared and I'm just, I'm learning. Thank you. Looking forward hopefully to seeing you in a couple of weeks at the Defensive to Resilient workshop. Lots of love everybody. Thank you.